Jesus. I don't know why they do. Um, they have this Trump commercial on. It's very strange. We have it? Yeah, it's this one right here. Hyundai of El Cajon is like a Trump guy. I won't let's go for fuck off my show. I thought that they would. We don't do political ads. I know it's not a political ad, but I know it's a going to Does that make you happy that Duke lost? No, you know, bad things happen to bad people. <laughs> Although nothing bad happens to Jalen House. Did you see him last night? No. Oh, he was on full display. Like blowing kisses, yelling at the fans after every bat, and he made scored like thirty five points. Really? Oh yeah. See you all tomorrow. But Gwen and Chris are just getting started. Sports talk it is. Your hosts, Tony Quinn Jr. How about Hungary? Tony needs one for the title. Uh, uh, hungry? Hungary? Hungary? Did you say Hungary? <laughs> he said Hungary. He's not allowed to win if he calls it Hungary. And Chris Ello. And uh, yeah. as soon as the white smoke comes out the chimney, They've got a new pope, What's and everybody chimney? celebrates. It's a chimney. Or a, <laughs> it's my version of a chimney. It's time to get you up to speed on all things sports. Yes! 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 With plenty of nonsense in between. Oh, look! Here comes our fearless producer! Gwen and Chris starts right now on 97.3 The Fan. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Here we go. Uh, <laughs> welcome, everybody. Finally, it's a Friday, and it is a Gwen and Chris surprise program for everybody on this Friday afternoon. We were not expecting this. Uh, I was uh, sitting uh, relaxing at home. Uh, Scraby was uh, busy walking his dog. Yes. And all of a sudden, we found out that the uh, Padres Futures game, otherwise known as Spring Breakout, uh -huh, uh -huh. was uh, being rain-delayed and perhaps rained out. Hopefully not. Yes, I, I'm really actually excited for this. I am. Well, imagine these these players. They're you know, very I mean, this is something this. that, you know, it's a showcase game. I mean, they want to get out there and play. And uh, Sam Levitt was prepared to call the game. It was supposed to get underway at 1 o'clock. But it has been raining uh, cats and dogs there in Peoria, Arizona, where the game was going to be played. And as far as we know, I'm going to I'm going to check in with my weather expert, Matt Scrabe, who's been looking at the Doppler radar radar. Thank you. And uh, he can give us an update. But if the game you know starts at any time, uh, we'll we'll be notified. We will have then, like 30 minutes and then we will happily step out of the way. Yes. And, uh, and and take the rest of the day off. But if the game does not start, guess what? You get a special edition of Gwen and Chris. A really special edition. Really special edition. Planned. Scraby and I have planned absolutely nothing for today. I mean, nothing. Zero, zip, nada, zilch. So, uh, you know, we're probably going to open up the phones, give everybody an opportunity to chime in if you'd like. Uh, on any subject, uh, we can certainly, the Padres, there's really no news on the Padres. All they've been doing the last 48 hours is traveling uh, that's not and true. sleeping. I did see some updates that we can get to. All right. Well, we'll get to whatever those are in a minute. But uh, I know Dylan Cease, uh, you know, followed the team there. And uh, the 31-man roster was released as in far as who made it yeah. uh, to, uh, to Korea, which gives us a pretty good idea of what the final 26-man roster will look like. They only have to shave off five more guys. And I think – of those, the five that they'll shave off, Scraby, I think at least four of them will be pitchers. So have to be. Yeah, we there's pretty so much, many pitchers. There's so many pitchers. They have like 17 pitchers on this uh, trip to Korea. How many outfielders, Chris? Uh, they have four. Four. They have four. <laughs> so I don't think any of those guys are going anywhere. No. Um, no, no. You know, really, to me right now, if you're going to ask me, uh, and I don't I, I should have had this in front of me. But like I said, we had nothing scheduled at all today. Um, if the 30 man roster, 31 man roster, the way it sits right now, uh, we know who the starting nine are going to be, or at least we think we know. Right. We yeah. think we know Cronenworth will be it for. And this is in this is, of course, if A.J. Preller doesn't make any more, you know, acquisitions of big, shiny objects. 
which he which could, he, which he definitely could. He doesn't even have to do it before Korea. He could do it after Korea and before the regular season starts. I, you know, was just listening to the tail end of the uh, round table, the Padres round table. And yeah, you know, Craig Elston, you know, brings up a you know solid point. I mean, if you get somebody like a Brandon belt on this roster, First of all, we'll have to hear Scraby say, I told you so, because yes. he's been calling for Brandon Belt for the last three months. But if they get Brandon Belt, it gives them so much more flexibility than what they have right now. You know, because you can put Belt at first base, then you can, you know, swing Kim across to third, and, and Manny is still, you know, recuperating. And it, and it put gives Jake you the chance and put uh, Cronenworth at second, move Bogarts to short. You move everybody, right? All four infield positions can move, but Belt can get in there. They also gives you a DH. He also gives you a solid DH, you know, if if Manny's in the field. Because right now, if Manny, you know, we know that the, the way it's going to be in Korea – is you're going to have Cronenworth at first base, you're going to have Bogarts at second, you're going to have Kim at short, and you're going to have either Tyler Wade, Graham Pauly, or Eggy Rosario at third. All three of those guys are on the Korea roster. I think one of the three will wind up, will wind up getting, uh, you know, be sent to a minor league camp yes. before the regular season starts. My guess is the odd man out will be Eggy Rosario just because Wade and Paulie have done better. That's my sure. only theory on that, but they've just done a little better. The four outfielders, as you said, Scraby, are not going anywhere. They only have four. Yeah, you got Profar. You've got uh, Jackson Merrill, who's going to be in center field. I mean, he, he just is. And uh, the only way he wouldn't be is if the Dodgers were starting a left-handed pitcher, but they're not. They're starting two right-handers. So Jackson Merrill will be in center, Fernando will be in right, and Azokar is your backup. And then the other thing is they got three the three catchers they're carrying, which I think they're going to stick with. They did put Brett Sullivan on there. You're right. Yeah, Sullivan is on there, and uh, of course Higashioka and Campusano. So, but those that is the entire traveling squad of actual players to Korea. Now the other seventeen are all pitchers. And I think that four of those guys will get shaved off before the season starts. And that's what you'll go with on opening day. I'm not so, mad at it. Well, I'm not mad at it. And we have talked ourselves really into believing that Jackson <laughs> Merrill is going to be all that. And he's he in a lot of ways has convinced us that he's going to be all that. Not yeah, it's only not us putting it on him. He's no, done this. He's, stuff. He, he's done this stuff and he's mentally, you know, everything he says makes you believe him even more. Right. I, I so, agree. you know, that, you know, we, but, but the bottom line to me, and, and I said this uh, earlier this week, I still have to wait and see. He has answered the questions in March, but the questions resurface when we get into April. They yeah. just do. There's a million guys that have been great in spring training in the history of baseball and have unfortunately never really been heard from again. You know? That so you have true. to you have to answer the question once the bell rings for good. I, but I, I said this the other but night. But he's deserved sorry. sorry, but he's deserved the opportunity to answer that question. Yes, I said this the other night, but it's like CJ Abrams. We were all very excited for him to make the opening day roster, and he struggled out of the gate. It was really difficult for him. And then he went back down and he got some, some things retooled and he came back up and he was pretty good. So I'm hoping that Jackson Merrill doesn't start out enough bad enough that he has to go to AAA, but it happens. It does happen, and there's no guarantee that that will happen or won't happen, but that is a question. The other question has got to be a third base because Manny's not there, and again, Tyler Wade is kind of a guy that has bounced around, right? This is not – Tyler Wade is having a really good spring. Yes. And he hit a grand slam the other day, and Tony was talking him up last week and saying, you know, this is the guy that can play third base. Mm -hmm. But Tyler Wade – has been in you know in baseball for 7 years all right he started with the yankees in 2017 
He's not a brand new kid now. I mean, how old is he here? He's 29. And the great news is he's, he's a local kid. He's from Murrieta High School, you know, which isn't far up the road there. Yeah. I mean, it's not local, but it's pretty local. It's local enough. It's local enough. So, there's a lot of Padres fans out there in Temecula, Marietta. Absolutely. Area. So, I mean, it's a great story. But Tyler Wade played five years with the Yankees. He never had more than 145 at-bats. So that tells you that. He was in the big leagues for parts of five years, but he was never an established guy, right? He got one year with the Angels, and he got 163 at-bats. Again, certainly not an everyday player. And then last year, he was with Oakland. He only got 51 at-bats with Oakland. Hey, if you can only get fifty one at bats with Oakland, tough lineup to crack, Chris. Yeah, that's a tough lineup to crack up there. You're making you're making some really so, good points. So you know that that's the thing considered. with Tyler Wade. He's been around for a long time. You know, is he ready to be kind of an everyday guy at least for the first month of the season? And if Manny comes back to third base, then is Wade going to be your DH? You know, that has to be a question. What it you, has to be a question. It's a fair question. What What are your thoughts on? Because because I've also received questions about this: the DH being a younger player or an unproven player. Because the DH position is basically you're you're only there to drive runs in, get on base. You're there to produce. That's pretty much the only way. But are you, you can, okay with a younger guy no, being a DH? I'm not. It, 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 the The DH position is is you know Manny's going to be there. So for the first few weeks, it's yeah. going to be fine. Yeah, yeah. But when Manny goes to third base, that's what I'm saying. Who's your DH? Are you going to move Merrill to left, put a Zokar in center, mm. and are you going to have Profar be your DH? Are you going to have Wade? Are you going to have Graham Pauly as your DH? Are you going to have Higashioka as your DH and then Sullivan as your backup catcher? They those, all, those options don't sound great. No, I don't think they do. That's, that's why a great. Have that's to exactly what I'm saying, Scraby. They are options. They on the surface sound okay, yeah, but there's nothing proven in any of those options at the DH position. Now, DH is a position where, if you look around the rest of the National League, guys are hitting 40 home runs and driving in 120 runs. Marcel Ozuna is a DH, Shohei Otani is a DH, Jorge Soler is a DH. All right. I'm just giving you a few. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not giving you every guy. But my point is DH is a position where you normally get 40 homers, 100 RBIs. What are the Padres going to get at DH? 15 homers if they're lucky? The way it stands now, I think you'd have to think that's the, the case. Anyway, the questions continue for the Padres. Sorry, I went quiet. I'm trying to figure out what happened with this game. What game? The uh the the spring breakout game the spring breakout game we know it's in a rain delay what are you well doing? no someone on the chat other... said it was canceled but oh. last time I didn't believe the chat I should have believed the chat but I still just texted Adam to see what's going on here okay well so you know if it's canceled we can just settle in yes, you and I yeah you know, that's fine I'm okay with that I I'm just not. Uh, I, I'm not <laughs> I'm rooting for the rain to stop and let oh, these okay. guys get out and play here well I want that to happen too but here we go Chris. <laughs> I'm looking at the weather radar right now. The in, Doppler? The Doppler in yeah. Arizona. The Doppler 19,000. Okay. And rain does look pretty bad. I'm not going to lie. However, the special weather statement that is on AccuWeather.com right now is... Oh, it just expired. The advisory effect at 2.16 p.m. So that's a that good mean? thing. They had a flash flood warning kind of thing, and oh, that, so now it's okay, expired, which done. means that it would be done. All right. Uh, no. But the rain does look pretty crazy. So out basically, there. the breaking news is we you don't know anything. Don't know. You don't know anything. Uh, but I'm uh, no. The breaking news is that the rain looks pretty strong. I'll okay. say. Well, uh, as long as it's raining, we'll be here. If it does stop, and for some reason they do play this game this afternoon, Sam Levitt will have the call from Peoria. In the meantime. We will get a little mad in the next segment. And what I'm talking about is March Madness when the Aztecs suddenly, somehow, miraculously at times figure it out. We'll talk to you about last night's game in the Mountain West Conference quarterfinals. Look at the rest of what's going on in the land of college basketball and conference tournament time as Gwyn and Chris surprisingly gets underway on a Friday. 
on 97.3 The Fan. Listen to your favorite. All right, welcome back to uh, a surprise Friday edition of Gwen and Chris. It will last as long as it needs to last. Padres uh, futures game against the Seattle Mariners, the spring breakout. Spring breakout. You know, that's what they get for naming it something so stupid. Okay. Not just calling it the uh, the Padres future game. Or what about the showcase? The spring, the, uh, the spring, spring breakout. Showcase. Yeah, well, they didn't call it that. They called it the... Uh, the spring breakout. So they're getting what they deserve, which is nothing but rain, unfortunately, in Peoria. So uh, if that uh, rain continues, then we will continue. If for some reason they uh, get the game underway, we will uh, we'll obviously have the game. So that's that. 2.22 is the time. Chris Ello, Matt Scraby together in our Odyssey Palace Studios. As far as I understand, Tony Gwynn Jr. is still sleeping. 
in Korea. <laughs> oh yeah, getting I, over the sixteen and a half hour flight or whatever it was. I never updated it, you guys on what I found out about the Korea trip so far. Well, why don't? Uh, well, I want to talk Aztecs basketball, but okay. we'll we can get to that. Go ahead. The Aztec uh, thing's not going anywhere. So, well, first, give me the latest update on first, Korea. Jeff Passan just tweeted, "It's nothing with the Padres, but Michael A. Taylor and the Pittsburgh Pirates are in agreement on a one-year, four million dollar deal." So, all right, he's so you can board. all forget about uh, the Padres the acquiring him. I'm uh, glad no, you. So, uh, I'm glad. I'm kind of glad, honestly. Why? Because I was never really too excited about Michael A. Taylor. I mean, he can he can run around and play center field and bat ninth. And we already saw Michael A. Taylor. He just hit from the left side of the plate, and his name was Trent Grisham. Oh. So I, I Michael A. Taylor can hit. He okay. can. No, in fact, okay. in fact, he's far less of a threat at the plate than Trent Grisham was. Because for all of his strikeouts, if you made a mistake, Trent Christian could hit a home run. Michael A. Taylor, if you make a mistake, he might bloop a single to center. So let the uh, Pirates have him for four million bucks. Yeah, that's my thing. That's my right. thinking. There. Back to the Korea stuff. Yes. So I saw the Padres tweeting out some videos and some stuff. They did their warm up at the stadium today. Bob Scanlon actually tweeted. I, you know, Bob Scanlon is creating a lot of FOMO in me, Chris. Fear of missing out. Because he is tweeting all these great pictures. The bullpens are actually underground or the arm barn. Sorry. It's not an arm barn. Stop <laughs> saying that. I will never call it that. So every time you call it that, I'm going to tell you to stop. Uh, the bullpens are underground. So okay. they're down there with like a batting cage. So they have to like run up some stairs to get up there. But Hassan Kim took a bunch of pictures with uh, some kids. And so they're doing some things right now. I'm sure that they are very tired, but it is uh, progressing over there. All right. But they're there. They're there. And they're having that's fun. pretty much all I'm that's pretty much all I'm concerned about is that they're there safely. They are there safely. All right. But uh, when do they play? They play Sunday. Sunday and then they play Sunday at 3 a.m. I believe they play Monday. I'm not sure what time. And then Wednesday and Thursday. Wednesday and Thursday are the big Dodger games. The games that yes. actually count in the standings. Yes. And then Wednesday, they play 3 o'clock in the morning. Then they don't play forget. Don't count games. And then they play count games again. Well, they come home before yeah. they do yeah. that, though. Because they're the one thing is, as soon as the second game against the Dodgers is over, they're getting on a plane and they're coming back. So, yes, they are. Because you've got the Peter Seidler. Uh, ceremony mm -hmm. on um, Saturday, yes, March 23rd, and then you've got the uh, Fan Fest on Sunday, March 24th. Yeah, so the Padres play on the 21st, and then they need to get back for all of that stuff. They do. Tony was telling me the schedule, and it is it is kind of crazy. It's a little hectic. It's very hectic. It's a little hectic, but you know they'll have to do the best they can with that. Uh, all right. Um, the Aztecs last night drove me absolutely crazy. Uh oh. I mean, let's be honest with you. I mean, we watched the first half in here together, you and I. And they they played some of the worst basketball I've seen them play this or almost any year under Brian Dutcher or Steve Fisher before that. They shot 22%. They missed every three pointer. Most of their three point attempts didn't even hit the rim. And that's true, right, Scrape? I mean, they were throwing air ball after air it was ball. Bad. They couldn't make a layup. A couple of their layups hit the underneath side of the rim. Yes. I mean, it was it was laughable. It was laughable. As you were watching this, and you're like, this team was in the NCAA final last year. This team was ranked most of this season. It was difficult to watch. But then everything changed right before halftime. UNLV got greedy. They did. I was thinking of this last night. UNLV got the ball with 1.6 seconds to go in the first half, but it was underneath their own basket. They called a timeout to try to set up a play and score from full court with 1.6 seconds. Now, the odds of them executing this play, even if they do it perfectly, are slim to none that you're going to go the length of the floor in a 1.6 seconds. So they call timeout. They set this great grand thing up and they throw it in bounds and Darian Trammell intercepts it. Yeah. And he intercepts the ball and he shoots a one-legged 
35 foot straight away three. We completely missed this too. We we had given up on we the did. half. We thought it was already halftime. You and I didn't see it. And he makes the shot. And all of a sudden, the second half starts and the Aztecs go crazy. Yeah. They had eight out of nine shots. They were throwing threes in left and right. Everything was working. Next thing you know, they're up by 12. And you're like, ah. Oh, yeah, this is the time. This is the team I was expecting. They uh, they uh, they woke up. They woke up, but then they did Aztec things again with about seven minutes to go in the game. They started missing shots. They really started missing free throws. Yes, I mean one after another, clanking off the rim. They ended up missing ten free throws in the game. Jaden Ladee, for as great as he was. Missed seven free throws by himself. All right? Yeah, he did. That didn't help the cause. Micah Parrish went down and bricked two. Just like that, UNLV comes back. They tie it up. It was in Micah Parrish was 0 for 6 from 3. Too. Yeah, Micah Parrish. He was 0 for 8. Over 8. Overall. Oh, overall. Oh, overall. Okay. Yeah, he had, but uh, you know what? The guy who replaces him normally, Elijah Sanders, was 0 for 5. And 0 for 4 from 3. Reese Waters was 1 for 7. I mean, it was bad. It was not good. (laughs) So they go into overtime, and I think, oh, I used to be confident about overtime because they won 11 games in a row, those close games. But coming into the game last night, they had lost their last six. We talked about this. Yeah. And I thought, oh, no, they're going to new, they're going to suffer another heartbreak. I felt it too. And they fell behind four points in the overtime. But then Jaden Ledee took over. I mean, it was just incredible. I mean, the the shot he made to put them ahead, that bank shot, was not an easy shot. No, not at all. That's what I was thinking. Not an easy shot. He banks that in. And then Lamont Butler, who you can say everything about this kid you want, but the one thing that is guaranteed is that he is going to defend you. And he was matched up against D. Don Thomas. And this kid, 18, that kid's 18 years old. Really? A freshman. Wow. He's much and better he than he is really, really tough. He is. And he was scoring at will, despite five guys trying to defend him. But finally, Lamont Butler got a couple of stops on him. He finally got a couple of stops. Ladie hit the free throws. And then there's three. What was a three-point lead, two seconds left. Brian Dutcher gets a timeout, brings his guys over to the bench, and you know what he told them? As soon as the ball comes in bounds, foul. Uh-huh. Do not, under any circumstances, let them try a three-point shot. Foul immediately. They didn't foul, though. You're right. They didn't do anything that he told them to do. What, what the heck? <laughs> they didn't do anything that they that. they didn't do anything that he told them to do. They let Thomas catch the ball, dribble unguarded down the floor to a 25 foot shot, which was very makeable. Very makeable. I thought he was going to make it just I, by how the game was. He going. deserved to make it because the Aztecs boxed the play up so badly. So who didn't get the message? Everybody apparently. <laughs> okay. I don't know. It was uh, Brian Dutcher's comment after the game was, "We sure executed that well." <laughs> I mean, he, you know, he At told least them he was a little bit uh, okay with. It. I mean, they the won bottom the, game, so. the bottom line is, and I've said this a hundred times, coaching is overrated. You got to coach. You can say all the things. The players still got to do it. Uh, and fortunately, the kid missed the shot, and I felt bad for him. He's basically crying yeah. going through the layup line. Look, they wouldn't have been close in that game if it wasn't for him. So he was phenomenal. Ladee finished with 34 and 16 rebounds. The Aztecs had 25 offensive rebounds. That's a lot. Yeah. You get that many, you ought to win the game going away. How many were putbacks that were missed? Probably two. <laughs> yeah. Two, just oh, two? Putbacks that they missed? Yeah. Oh, no. 23. <laughs> okay. Yeah. That's what I, I thought. I, I think they missed them all, but they got a lot of opportunities. They survived 74-71. They'll play Utah State later. Now, we'll talk more about this as the show goes along. Is a rebound, is it scored? Like, it has to come off the rim, and then you gain possession, that's a rebound, right? Uh-huh. Or if you tip it back up. 
that if you, counts as a that's rebound. That's a rebound, too? yes. Because you if possessed you, it enough to put it back up towards the basket. If you tipped it back up toward the basket, that's a rebound for you. They used to joke around. Moses Malone, do you remember this guy? Played for the 76ers way back when. I do know. Of he was him. a big dude. And Moses used to get under the hoop, throw it up the ball, throw up the shot. And just put it on the backboard and the rim, and then just start jumping up and volleyball tapping it. And he used to tap it three or four times before he'd finally get he'd it to go get in. Four rebounds, so he'd get four rebounds on every play. But then yeah. his field goal percent suffered. Yeah, it, that's true. But his rebounding was his rebounding numbers were gigantic because Moses used to do the tap uh, to himself. All right, uh, Aztecs do prevail. We'll talk more about their game tonight against Utah State when we come back. More Gwen and Chris ahead. Who knows what's coming next? I have no idea.
All right, welcome back to Gwen and Chris. Uh, surprise to us, special Friday afternoon show. Uh, normally, we have a show on Friday, except for this week, we weren't supposed to have a show on Friday because they were going to play the Padres Mariners Futures game. As a matter of fact, I refuse to call it anymore spring breakout. I think you're concra- con- con- contractually, contractually obligated. Contractually obligated. To call it's it easy for you to say. Spring breakout. Very yes. easy for you to say. Uh, yes, the uh, the game got uh, rained out, and no! uh, yeah, they just announced it a few minutes ago officially uh, that the uh, game is rained out. So no Padres future stars, no Mariners future stars, and most disappointing of all, no Sammy Levitt on the mic getting to call the ball game mm. today. That's what I was looking forward to. Yeah, me too. I know so, you were looking forward to that. I really was. More than us. I spent I know, five minutes on Sammy Lev last night on the Scraby Show talking uh, about I know it. Sammy Levitt was looking forward to it. Sorry about that, Sam. He joins us from Rainy Peoria. I'm bummed out for you, man. Yeah, I know you were ready to call this game. It's been a while since you've had a, a good play-by-play run. Yeah, it's a bummer, um, but you understand it. it. It was raining quite a bit up uh I would say it started raining maybe about a half hour before the game and then really fairly steadily uh, until about 2 p.m. here, tarp on the field. And and look, uh, top prospects, guys that obviously mean a lot to these teams and these organizations. So you understand they want to play it safe. Um, We'll see what the details are about this uh, reported uh, reschedule uh, of a game. Uh, uh, March 23rd, at least, is uh, what the uh, Mariners development account tweeted out so uh, we'll, we'll see what the Padres tweet out what in- information they can provide but yeah bummer um and uh yeah as far as uh my play-by-play I guess we'll have to wait until uh, another day huh no that's ridiculous I mean come on you mean the rain stopped at two o'clock I mean if I was you, um, if, if I well, was you Sam I would have pulled the tarp off myself and start <laughs> squeegeeing the well, field and no, go let's no. go well, number one, I don't know that it's I don't know that it's done. I don't know that it's done raining. Yeah, um, could for sure could start again. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's still overcast. Uh, yeah. It rained already a little bit this morning. It was raining at a steady rate. And I get it. No, no, no I, I, I know totally, you get totally it. get it. I know Look, you get the, it. The, re- the reality with these things are obviously uh, this was a very promoted event. It has been credit to Major League Baseball and the teams and the organizations they have done really quite a job if you've noticed on social media and everywhere of of making a really big deal out of this and and i think it's great i mean honestly this matchup between the padres and mariners might be the best spring breakout matchup we have as far as the the systems and and the rosters even with the padres having a number of guys they had to take off due to the uh, trip to korea and the dylan cease trade so but they were uh, doing these all over baseball right sam i mean the orioles and the pirates had one the other day yeah, from yesterday through Sunday. I got you. Um, okay. Every team will play one. Every organization will play one of these games. So, wow. um, yeah, disappointing, but uh, yeah. you, you get it. Look, you, you have to – it is an exhibition at the end of the day, so you have to you have to be very careful with this stuff, just like you would be in a major league spring training game. They're exceedingly careful, and yeah. uh, you certainly understand it. And uh, maybe another day. We'll see. I'm tired of people being careful, though. Just, you know, got to live your life out there. You yes. got to live your life. Yes, those got... million dollar uh, players. That's right. Get them out there. Get them out there. Come on. Anyway. Well, yeah, yeah look, uh, it's Didn't guys happen. out there with uh, big signing bonuses. Yeah, exactly. And yeah. Prospects. Fair point. They, Fair yeah, point. No, it's, it's, I think it's the same thinking that goes into, uh, you know, a regular spring training game where you, you really want to be careful. So. Yeah, so what's uh, so what's your thoughts on uh, the thirty man thirty one man roster, as it was uh, set by the Padres going into uh, the Korea series, Sam? What did you? Well, any surprises to you? Um, no, not really. Uh, no surprises. I mean, we got the answer as to which position player would be left off, and that was Oscar Mercado. But aside from that, I mean, we we kind of knew based on the guys that were still in Major League Camp and the number of position player spots they had um, that that I I think I may have talked to you about this one, maybe not you guys, Ben and Woods or or Craig and Annie, um, that essentially one guy out of that position player group was going to be left off. The Padres decided to go with 17 pitchers on the travel roster, which obviously was not a, was not a surprise. And look, a lot happened between the time they, they 
said it, and then uh, they actually left with the trade for Cease. So Wilson gone, Cease now on the roster with the 17 pitchers. No surprise that Avila, Morahone, uh, that a lot of guys made it onto the travel roster. And look, I we made a big deal out of the travel roster. I think in retrospect, like, yeah, that was part of it is they kind of whittled down the, the big group. But the big decisions are coming up here in the next few days when we see who starts, who appears in the exhibition games, then who's on the 26-man roster for the two games against the Dodgers, and then ultimately who's uh, on the roster on the 28th. So no real surprises, I thought. We got the answer about Mercado not being on it, but uh, yeah, n- nothing really, uh, really shocked you about the uh, travel roster at this point. Yeah, nothing shocked me about the travel roster either, Sam, if you cared. We don't. Uh, <laughs> I knew you were going to say So that. let's move hold on. on. Hold what? on. So, so do you have a question. question about, was there a question there? No, I do have a question that I was asked on Twitter last night after the Scraby show, and I'm curious for you guys' answers, but with Darvish, Musgrove, and Cease going one, two, three, they're all righties. Does that worry you at all about the potential matchups going forward? Sam. I'm panicked personally. Um, <laughs> I hope Sam can really? make me feel better. Um, look, it's a little odd not to have a lefty starter. I suppose it's not the end of the world. The weird thing is that the Padres are are full of righties. Uh, anybody who would make a start right now. I mean, you even think about Vasquez and Brito and Waldron, the guys in that mix, Avila from the start of spring training. They're everybody's all righties. Righty. Yeah. yeah, everybody's a righty. To be honest with you, as far as like guys that would make a start anytime soon i'd really have to go back and, and look at kind can't of, even find anybody really yeah Sam. i mean I, there's I nobody there of, they got four I, lefties on the staff and they're all relievers yeah so I can there's think no of like you know Robbie this is it this is, i'm, I'm gonna be honest i'm gonna tell whoever who, whoever texted you or, or, or chatted you or was concerned about this eh, stupid don't be don't, concerned. Don't say stupid. Yeah, I, They're I don't, not stupid. I, it's it's stupid to be concerned is my is yeah. where I wanted to go. Because yeah, I, you want yeah. the best five pitchers. It doesn't matter. This has no – this isn't like putting a lineup together where you want to, you know, try to alternate righty, lefty, et cetera, right. for matchups. This is getting your best five starters out there regardless. If they were all lefties, then they'd all be lefties. Yeah, look, I, I guess hypothetically against lineups that – you know, are are left-handed heavy that hit righties well. Maybe you run into a problem a little bit if you only have righties. So let's say in a three, four game series, whatever it is, you you don't have a lefty throw. Yeah, it could be a little bit of a disadvantage. But to your point, the bigger problem is if you don't have lefties in your bullpen day to day and the Padres have plenty of those. So who knows? Um, You know, I, I think I think now it's going to be really interesting with the addition of Cease and seeing if this team at at minimum can hang around into the season, be around a postseason spot, and how aggressive, and we're a ways away from this, but how aggressive they would be, let's say, uh, during the summer and at the trade deadline, let's say they they, ident- they identify the need for a left-handed starter. We're a ways away from that, but it's something to think about, monitor, keep in mind. I don't think it's the biggest deal in the world, though, no. Sam Levitt is in uh, rainy Peoria today. The uh, Futures game got uh, canceled today, got rained out today. So uh, that uh, leaves us doing a show, and it leaves Sammy without a game to call. But he's nice enough to join us here. Uh, now, are you uh, heading back to San Diego after this, Sam? Are you? Uh, do you have anything left to do there? Or there's nobody there other than young players, right? Well, yeah, th- there's – well – I don't have anything left to do as far as coverage here. If I really wanted to, I'm sure I could do plenty with the minor leaguers, but I right. will head back tomorrow. I've got some dinner plans tonight. Quite frankly, I haven't packed up or anything yet. Cause I, I, oh, uh, boy. I, uh, w- I knew I always knew I was leaving tomorrow. So I still will leave tomorrow. Got one night left in the Airbnb. Then I'll uh, head out of here uh, sometime tomorrow morning. <laughs> but I, I do think it's important. I do think it's important to note. Um, and I don't know that people always realize this, that just because the major league team isn't here doesn't mean there's nothing going on at the complex. In fact, there's a lot going on. It's all of minor league spring training still going on, and that's every full season team. That's guys who will play in the Arizona Complex League potentially. Uh, there are there are still you know I don't know how many exactly, but between players and coaches and support staff, and medical staff, and the people who run Peoria Sports Complex. There are still at least 100, 200, I don't know what number it is, people here 
um, on a day-to-day -day basis as these guys get ready for the minor league season. So you show up in Peoria on any given day. It's actually pretty active as far as the bullpens and the backfields. And I don't know that people realize that minor leaguers actually play each other as well. Like, uh, for example, the Rangers double A team uh, that's going to start the year will come to Peoria to play the Padres double A team and vice versa. The Padres double A team will go to Mesa to play the Cubs double A team. So spring training continues. It's a weird year because it's March 15th and the major leaguers are done for good, but uh, still a lot of activity here. But uh, unless uh, our friend Adam Klug tells me I'm, I'm staying here for extensive if minor league coverage. You if he tells you you're staying there, you tell him you're not. <laughs> if he tells me I'm staying here for extensive minor league coverage, <laughs> honestly, be fine. There's a lot to talk about, and uh, I enjoy the minor league stuff. I, I doubt that's going to happen. No, so, we yes, need you I back. assume I'm out of here tomorrow. Yes. We need you back in San Well, yeah, the game's in uh, – sorry. No way. We got games uh, yeah. just uh, in a handful of days here, 2 a.m. Yeah. pregame. We need He's going to be 2 a.m. on Wednesday morning, 2.05 a.m. You know what? I'm going to be sitting right beside him, Scrib. I'm going to come Kluge into the studio. Adam said on the chat, you're staying there, Sammy. <laughs> yeah, right. I know. I'm gonna I'm gonna come in at 2 a.m. on uh, on Wednesday and just sit with Sam. Just give him a little support. You, you are not. You I'm, don't, I, don't make promises I'm already, you can't keep. I'm already planning to be at the uh, at the uh, Seven Mile Casino. You better be there. You have party. locked yourself no way. in. At 3 That's what I said. Absolutely, Sam. I'm gonna be there. I'm not missing that. That's what I, I said, Sam. I don't buy that for a second. You don't think no I'll offense, be there, Chris? You guys don't think I'll you're, be there? Hold on. Chris, you're telling me you're going to be up at 2, 3 a.m. and going down to Seven Mile Casino. You guys don't understand how my – I'm so old now that, that first of all, I have to get up about 13 times every night, all right? Oh, gosh. Not that many. Not, but we you didn't know need I'm, to know I'm, that. I'm, well, you know what I'm saying. Wow. If, well, if you're there, good for you. <laughs> so I, I'll be up anyway. I'll be up. <laughs> i got nothing to do. All right, I want to ask you two quick questions, Sam. i got three okay. minutes. Yeah. Who do you think is going to be the number five starter? Mm -hmm. If you had to call it, and of Rosario, you got Eggy Rosario, Tyler Wade, or Graham Pauly. Which of those three do you think will get get the short end and be sent out before the twenty six man roster? If you had to call those two races, mm -hmm. not easy, but I'm going to give you a shot. Uh, the number five spot. I said yesterday on the uh, round table. I thought Waldron. I'll stay with that. Okay. Um, you know, how confident am I in that? I don't know. Um, I think there's a case for Burrito uh, for sure. But to me, Matt Waldron's earned it. He's been great. I like the fact that he's built up, you know, a little bit more innings wise and a little bit more traditional starter wise than some of the other guys okay. from last year. You know, although it's, you know, I don't know. Does having Dylan Cease, the fact that now you've got a guy who could eat up some innings, does that change the equation? I don't know, but I'll go with Waldron. I will. Okay. He's earned it too. So I'll say him and we'll see if that actually happens. Um, as far as the Wade Rosario Pauly part, uh, I have to really crunch the, the 26 here, but um, I think Pauly's, I think Pauly's going to make it. Okay. I do. I've thought that for some time. I'm not going to back down on that. I thought Wade's going to make it. I would say if there was, if I had to pick one guy on the outside looking in, I would say Rosario um, for the reason of Wade's had a great spring. I think Pauly has had a really good spring. And I do believe that, the, you know, that, that taking Graham Pauly to Korea and the way they started him throughout the Cactus League, the way they've treated him, to me, it said a lot throughout the spring. And I I would imagine if you, if you used him like that during the spring and you took him to Korea, that you are planning in all likelihood to put him on the roster. And I'll tell you this, if he's going to be on the roster, he's going to play. He's got to play because he can't sit and play once a week. That's And I know, you know, uh, philosophy wise the Padres they believe in these young guys if if, if that they believe can make an impact that they got to play so I think Paulie if he's on the roster is going to find a way into the lineup at least early on you see what he can do uh, more days than not so for that reason with Paulie Wade set a good spring and also Wade can play the outfield a little bit I think he's a little bit more versatile than Rosario is defensively I've never had the sense that the Padres are you know, like married to the idea of Rosario has to be up there. 
So I'll I'll say Wade and Paulie make it, and Rosario is on the outside looking in. Of course, they could all make it hypothetically. I'd have to crunch the bench again. Oh, no, they'd have to. They'd couple. have to send Sullivan down. They got to send somebody down. All well, right, and, so, and and yeah. So so and let's pick one. That. Let's let's pick one on the outside looking in, and yeah. I'll say Rosario's on the outside looking in with Paulie and Wade making it. All right, Sam, go enjoy your uh, the rest of your day. Uh, hopefully, you'll eventually get to announce this game somehow, somewhere, <laughs> somehow. But uh, you know, if not, uh, Scraby and I will put together. You know, maybe a celebrity softball game you can come out and announce or something. Well, there. hey, I could, I could, you know, I could just make it up right now. We could go on the air. I could look out on the field and just make it up. Robbie oh. Snelling out of the windup and the first pitch of the afternoon <laughs> on the outside corner, strike one. Oh. Snelling a fantastic first. I mean, yeah. see, this is don't what get I in his way. Do it in his way. This, you know, you keep know what going. I could do. Yeah, we could going, do the re- we could do we could do the recreation broadcast. Give me a ball, a mitt, <laughs> a, a bat, a two bats. Crack them together for the hits. It's like this. Hear this? Oh, yeah, like go. one. Man, what a that's nobody what... will know. It's not actually going on. I'll just make it up as I go, and there you go. There's your uh, spring breakout game. <laughs> that's uh, what Ronald Reagan used to do. What? Like this. Ronald Reagan began his career as a uh, as a broadcaster. Really? Yeah, yeah. reading yeah. Uh, reading the ticker tape and cracking bats together that's to right. uh, to make the sound of wow. the uh, yeah. You re- ready for this? Watch this. L- l- listen to how good this could be. Snelling out of the windup in the two two. In there, strike three. Wow! Dang. Whoa! Wow! See, he's a full. Let he's me a, go. He's a full. Never mind. Never mind guy. the game. Let's just let you know what. <laughs> I'm going home. Sam, you go ahead and broadcast a make believe game between now and six o'clock. Just go. have fun with there it. We can go. tell the difference. All right. right thanks, Sam. Noise, we're good. All right, thanks, bye, buddy. Guys. We appreciate it as always. You are the Thank man, you, Sam. Sam is the man. There's no doubt. All right. Uh, Gwen and Chris continues. We got Daily Gambit stuff coming up. Matt Scraby, a perfect 5 and 0 night last night picking games. What, I, Is I, it possible? I, what? Yeah. Come I haven't back. even checked. Come back. We'll find out together. Is Gwen and Chris. Oh, we're not to the top of the hour. Oh, wait. Now. Hold on. Yes. No, we're fine. We're fine. I just need to do this. Play a little music. See, today is going to be a show where I cannot actually make a mistake because we're in a free for all, Chris. Free for all? A free for all, I tell you. I don't find it to be a free for all. This is everything, man. Everything's on the line here. All right. We're on the air. We got to make it work. Okay. Special show till six o'clock. We got a countdown coming up. I think it's one of the best countdowns we've ever had. I agree. I know Scraby's going to absolutely I agree with this love one. Love it beyond oh, belief. All right. We'll check into that in the three o'clock hour. More Gwen and Chris for your entertainment on this Friday. <laughs>
All right, welcome back. 3 o'clock hour getting underway. Show is starting to take some shape here. We caught up with Mark Ziegler in Las Vegas ahead of tonight's Aztecs game against Utah State. In the Mountain West Conference semifinals, I think Mark will come on hopefully here in about 15 minutes. We'll talk about that. The other semifinal game, by the way, will be Colorado State and New Mexico. Uh, we'll talk about those results in a moment. As we get into what is going to turn out to be a glorious for Scraby Daily Gambit. Do you like money? I think about money a lot. Do you like money without doing anything? Uh, duh, winning. Do you want to make money while watching sports? I think Washington is immortal luck. Washington! Woohoo! If you answer yes, this is your segment. Just don't blame us when you lose. Nothing is ever your fault. It's your game. Take it. Gwen and Chris go through the top bets of the day in The Daily Gambit on 97.3 The Fan. Daily Gambit is our daily sports betting segment here on Gwen and Chris. Please, everybody, gamble responsibly. Uh, as Chris said, the th- things are starting to take shape now, which is nice. So we'll get on a nice little groove here. Yeah, we got start. a good, we got a great countdown at the bottom of the I am of this so hour. excited for this countdown. I know. We uh-huh. might even need two segments, Chris. I'm not kidding. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Uh, we'll see where that goes. But we may need five segments. We may take a half an hour on each subject. Don't think I can't take I you know up you on can. that. I know you can. Uh, all right. So we made some bets last night. The Aztecs were four and a half point favorites over UNLV. Uh, both of us chose UNLV, which was a good thing for us. Because the Aztecs, they did win 74-71. They did not cover, so yeah. we win that one. It was hard to believe the Aztecs were going to win by more than four and a half the way they've been playing. Yeah. But it was nice to see them get a close victory, and we'll talk more about it with uh, Mr. Ziegler here shortly. Boise State, one-point favorite. And by the way, all you out there telling me it's Boise, it's not. No. I've been told so many times by Boiseans that it's Let Boise. me tell you something. When you get the game notes before you do a Boise okay. State game, all right. it says – our name is pronounced Boise. Boise. Not Boise. It sounds better Boise, though. It does, but they don't like it. They like Boise. I just had to get that out there. I'm glad I you get... did because all those people <laughs> that are giving you a hard time are just flat out wrong. Boise State in New Mexico. Uh, Boise State, again, one-point favorite. New Mexico, Chris and I chose them, and they won by 10, 76-66. And everybody's favorite, Jalen everybody's favorite, Jalen House, 30-some-odd points. And running around like a lunatic on the floor, jawing at fans, waving, blowing kisses, got in a big, almost got in a fight at the end of the game because he got taken down trying to go up for a dunk. Guess what, Jalen? Everyone hates you. (laughs) So if you go up for a dunk, they're not going to let you have it. Yeah, You you bring it upon yourself. That's a good point. He brings it upon himself. I mean, if I was playing against this guy and he's clowning the whole game, and then he goes up for a dunk at the end to try to, you know, put a seal on it. I'm going to do everything I can to not let him have it. That's just – that's he gets that. Dude, that's a good point. But Sorry. still, I, I, I like the villain aspect of everything. Well, he, le- he definitely likes to be the villain. That is uh, my favorite You're okay part. with that. Uh, Nevada, they were three-point favorites over Colorado State, and Chris chose Nevada. I chose Colorado State. Colorado State did win by 7, 85-78. Yeah, Colorado State, with uh, they've been slumped the second half of the season. That was a nice win for them. Nevada's – both teams are into the tournament, mm-hmm. into the NCAA tournament, but uh, I thought Nevada would get this game. They've been on a hot – they've been the hotter team coming in, but – didn't happen. Didn't happen. No. Uh, to the NBA, the Bucks. By the way, if you're keeping track, Scraby is so far 3-0. and Oh, yes. I was letting everybody uh, just just <laughs> stay away from my uh, bragging here and ju- for just a second. But okay. uh, the next game, Bucks were seven-point favorites over the Sixers. Both of us chose the Bucks, and the Bucks won 114-105. So that works. We got that one. Now, the Clippers, uh, the Clippers... You know, Adam sent me something. I was not okay. Here we no, go. No, they were five and a half over the Bulls. No, no, no. I, I have to play you something that you probably have not heard yet. Well, can you wait yes. a second? The Clippers five and a half points over the Bulls, and we both chose the Clippers. The Clippers won one twenty six, one eleven. So a perfect five and a day for Mister Scravey. Very Heck good. Yeah, I was four and one. We only disagreed on one game, uh, the Nevada Colorado State game. So, uh, uh, very good. Do you want to play this in the middle of the daily yes, game? It's about the Bulls. 
It's about the Bulls. Charles Barkley said this about oh, the God. Bulls. Oh, God. I can imagine. George had 28, 11 out of 12 I actually don't know where it is in this clip, but we'll listen. Let me tell you something. The Bulls couldn't win Mark Mathis. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> It's a funny, uh, it's a funny line, Charles, but I beg to differ because Demar Derozan is still a great player, even on a uh, mediocre team. But that was a funny line. That was Charles a funny. Was line. funny. Uh, all right, all right go to. Uh, all right, we got today's games. Yes. All right, Scraby. By the way, for the week, fourteen and six. Oh, wow, that's my best week ever. Seventy percent. You yeah. ought to be like a professional handicapper. I mean, these guys. No, that are I on, don't think so. But After, these guys that are on television and the radio and all of these phone guys, they're not that good. For this week, I'm I'm good. Next week, I'll probably be six and fourteen. Well, so far this week, you're outstanding. I'm ten and ten. All right, Aztecs are five point favorites over Utah State. Wow! Despite the fact that the Aztecs are the five seed and Utah State is the one seed, I, I don't get these these spreads. I don't get. That's them. a weird one. Uh, I'll let you go first, Mister Fourteen and Six. <laughs> um. I do feel like last night proved to the Aztecs that they can win close games. And it, my my uh, optimism says they're unlocked. I'm going to say Aztecs. Go Aztecs, me too. I, I feel like they – I mean, they won on a night where they couldn't hit the broadside of a barn, you know, on a, sh- on a shot. They got to shoot better tonight. Utah State's been good, but uh, I'll take the Aztecs too. Uh, the other game, New Mexico, the seventh seed, is favored by three – over Colorado State. I take it back. New Mexico's the sixth seed. Colorado State's the seven. Mexico's favored by three. I hate to take Jalen House again. But again, I don't think New Mexico wants to take any chances. That win last night probably got them for sure into the NCAA tournament. But they don't want to risk it. New Mexico is my pick here. All I think right. it's going to set up an Aztecs versus Jalen House oh. final on Saturday. Who do you like here? I know you went to CSU, so you're going to go with the hometown boys again? Say the spread again. I just need to hear it one more time. Uh, three points, New three Mexico. Three points, New Mexico. Yeah, I think Colorado got... State's going to take it. All right, you got them. They're good. It's a really great tournament. I mean, you wa- I'm watching these games yesterday. Even the Utah State-Fresno State went into overtime. The- they're playing at a high level, you know, in these games, and it's fun to watch. It and is. I-, I just hope, really, that this year is the year that the Mountain West does some damage in the March Madness. Well, I was looking at the breakdown of number of teams per conference. And the, oh, yeah. They're and, gonna and get the Mountain six. West might have six. Like, that's that's one of the better conferences in basketball. Yes, but you have to back it up. You then have to go into the tournament and, and win, win a few games. Yeah. Uh, ACC, number one there, North Carolina, seven and a half over number four, Pittsburgh. Seven and a half. Bro. It's the four. It's the uh, semifinal of the ACC. Duke is not in the other semifinal I'm happy to report Kyle Filipowski. Is he crying somewhere? I don't know. But Is he he's, tripping He's trying to somewhere? trip somebody somewhere. That really bothered me because you yeah, cannot act like a victim when you get pushed over by a fan, but then you trip someone. And he totally did it. And then he claimed that he didn't know what happened. I mean, he just uh, – <sighs> Filipowski's uh, – put, put him in the book, Scraby. Oh, he's File in the him book. Under wow. F. File him under F. Jeez. Yeah, that, that, that really bothered me. Okay, Kyle North Philip Carolina House. and Pittsburgh. I'm going to take North Carolina. You're going to give the points there, seven and a half. I'm going to say Pittsburgh uh, keeps it close, but Carolina is capable of blowing out anyone. But I think Pittsburgh needs to uh, – the resume building still. Uh, Pac-12, top seed Arizona, 11 and a half over Oregon. Arizona's a weird team. I mean, they win games by 30 points sometimes, they and do. then they lose to crappy teams. They, they're they very hard to figure. I say tonight they're on uh, they're on fire. They're on I'll fire. take Arizona tonight. Give 11 and a half. I'm going to go the other way. Just I think Arizona's going to win, but that's a lot of points. So I'm going to go. Too many points, I'm going to go or, Oregon. All right. In the uh, Big 12, it's a really good game. Iowa State, one point over Baylor. Both teams are like top 10 quality going to be two or three seeds in the NCAA tournament. Iowa State by one over Baylor. I, I don't know what else to tell you about this game other than that both teams are really highly ranked. Is it me? Yeah. I'm going to go with Brock Purdy and his Iowa State Cyclones. <laughs> Brock Purdy. <laughs> his Iowa State Cyclones. All right. Iowa State to me is the team that takes most advantage of their home court. 
Oh. They blow out anybody on their home court, but All this right. is not on their home court. Oh, okay. This is a neutral site, so I'll take Baylor, Baylor. plus the one. Uh, the Big West tonight in Las Vegas, UC Irvine, eight points over Long Beach State. I'm taking Long Beach State. They got a really good coach, Dan Monson, who uh, was the guy who began the whole Gonzaga thing many years ago. Oh, yeah. They also, I actually have heard that name. Their athletic director, Bobby Smitherin, used to work at San Diego State. Okay. Listened to our show every day on his way home. Really? And now as the new AD at Long Beach State, I ran into him in Las Vegas. He said the only thing he hates about working at Long Beach State can't listen, to our, can't listen to our show anymore. Did you tell him about YouTube? And I the told Odyssey him all of that stuff. Yes, I did. But I don't know that he wants to do all that. But I got a root for him tonight. So I'm taking Long Beach State plus the eight. Man, you really put uh, me in a corner here. I know you can't take Irvine now after uh, all that. But the Irvine head coach came on after he, they won that one time, remember? Okay. Well, if you want to. I'm going can... Long Beach State that, that boy. because he is a, a listener to our station. Listener to our show. Uh, one NBA game tonight worth mentioning. New Orleans at home, six points over the Clippers. Clippers. I am uh, not up. You are up. I'm going to go seven games today. We're doing a lot. I'm going to go with the uh, Zion Williamson. You're going for Zion Pelicans. Williamson's? I am going to take the Clippers. I don't think anybody beats them by more than six. Not, not even the Pelicans. Not even Zion. Is Kawhi able to? to he stand? played last night. So he was he okay. looked fine. He looked fine last so night. So basically, he wanted to go home and just rest. Yeah, exactly. Maybe that is the way out of like um, load management. You start the game, you claim back tightness, and you go home. Well, I don't know why I'm so angry about. Don't be this. being mean to Kawhi ever. Don't, don't ever do that. All right, all right. Uh, Mark Ziegler from Las Vegas. An update on the Mountain West tournament coming up shortly. Never miss a moment.
All right, welcome back to Winning Chris. There's a couple of things you can really count on, Scraby. Death, taxes, and a great story in the paper every morning by Mark Ziegler following Aztec basketball. Mark is uh, nice enough to join us on short notice in Las Vegas today. Mark, thanks so much. How are things in Vegas? The Aztecs are probably a little relieved to still be alive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, it's raining here. Okay. Which I thought was kind of interesting. Woke up and it was raining. Hmm. But yeah, I, I, um, I think there's kind of a palpable sense of relief um, because, you know, look, let's not fool anybody. They were not playing well. And they did not play well again yesterday. And it, it wasn't on the same scale as last year's Charlotte game, the first, first game, uh, Charleston game, and the first game of the NCAA tournament when they didn't play well and they almost lost and they pulled it out. And then they just kind of, you know, there's this weight lifted off their shoulders and they rolled from there. But it's kind of the same feeling. I think that, you know, they kind of feel like, hey, we made some plays down the stretch finally. We won a close game, technically on the road. Um, and it just boosted up a little bit. So I think they're in a much better place mentally today than they were yesterday. Well, I hope so, because you're right. I mean, the first half was not easy to watch, not for the faint of heart. I mean, air balls, layups hitting the underside of the rim, turnovers, the whole the whole thing. But uh, I thought that play Darian Trammell made was, was, you know, big. And I wonder what you were thinking. UNLV calls a timeout there with 1.6 seconds left. Really, what are the odds that they're going to score in a full court play? Thought they got a little greedy, and the uh, Trammell made them pay for it. Yeah, I think, you know, part of the thought was that there was going to be 2.5 seconds left because if you did the math, and it was a shot clock violation right before that on San Diego State. If you'd done the math um, and and subtracted the shot clock from the game clock, it was 2.5. Okay. So with 2.5, you think you can get the ball up the floor and you know, up the floor and maybe get a decent look at a three. Right. And then the, during that timeout and that break, they they reviewed it and they only I mean I don't even know if they did review it, but they just gave them 1.6. Okay. And uh, and then it went downhill from there very quickly for them and. They knew that was a costly play, and the Aztecs, uh, you know, I don't know if the players knew as much as the coaches realized that that was a big turning point for them, and they really pumped them up in the, at halftime, just kind of saying, look, guys, don't be so glum. You know, we just got a huge momentum change there, and that's going to lift the lid on the basket. Talking to Mark Ziegler here, talking about the Aztecs basketball team and Jaden Ladeep basically putting the team on his back. But I want to ask about the final play of the game because I thought – I didn't know. Chris told me earlier in the show that that Brian Dutcher said to foul him immediately upon catching the ball, but no one even touched him, and he did get a pretty good look off or pretty good shot off. Do you know what happened there? Well, you know, they, you call timeout with two point seven seconds left, and you're up three. It's a pretty good indication you're going to try to foul. But when I asked Brian Dutcher about it afterwards, he goes, "Yeah, well, it was tricky because with two point seven seconds, they're not going to have a lot of time before they catch." And they have to shoot. And so you, the, the, the nightmare is, and the nightmare that every coach has, is that you, you tell your team to foul, and they foul a guy in the act of shooting a three, and they get three free throws. Right. Um, this was, you know, they had to go the length of the floor. And so I think the plan was, look, if he catches his back to the basket, foul him. And then beyond that, we're going to put two guys on Deed and Thomas, you know, Butler and Trammell, one in front, one behind, and just make them take a ridiculously hard three. And that was, that was what he really wanted. And none of that happened. I think they had a chance to foul. They didn't foul. And then they didn't, they didn't bracket them. And, and Dutcher, Dutcher uh, uh, afterwards, you know, someone asked, I, someone asked him about it. And he just said, well, uh, that went well, didn't it? Yeah, <laughs> it didn't, but it, it turned out okay. All right, give me a quick uh, preview of tonight's game. Uh, going, you know, to looking at the two games during the regular season between the Aztecs and Utah State and what we can expect tonight. Well, they split the games at home. Um, they were in the game at Logan, um, down one late, and and just fell apart down, just like they did in every other road game, just couldn't make plays down the stretch and lost by uh, like five. Uh, but it was a much closer game there. Uh, I think they have a great chance tonight because um, Utah State is not a very deep team. They're not built for three games in three days or even two games in two days. And one of their starters, um, Mason Fowles, uh, Paul Slev is, is out, uh, and he, he, he could still play tonight, but he didn't play yesterday with a, with a shoulder. Um, they went to overtime as well, uh, don't have a deep bench. 
Um, you know, Osibor looked absolutely exhausted. So did Ladie, but if, you know, if you're looking at, you know, exhaustion, I, I'll take Ladie. He's in much better shape uh, than <laughs> Osibor, great Osibor. Is. So I, I think it's a great shot for the Aztecs. I think on a neutral floor, they're the better team. Now they're still going to have to make some shots, something they haven't done. Um, but uh, I think they, they just, given their pedigree in this tournament, and maybe they have a little bit of their swagger back now, I, I, I like to think that this is the kind of game they can go and take care of business. Talking to Mark Ziegler here about the Aztecs and with Jaden Ledee facing great Osabor, and he's the guy who won the Mountain West uh, Coaches Player of the Year. Do you think there's any, I mean, I'm sure there's extra motivation, but what do you think Jaden Ledee is, how he's going into this game playing against the guy who beat him out? Well, I'm sure he's, he's thinking, I want to prove to him that I'm the, I prove to everybody that I'm the player of the, you know, should be the consensus player of the year. And Osabor is looking at him going, well, I was the coaches player of the year. I don't know what the media was thinking. I'm going to, I'm going to prove to everybody that <laughs> I'm the player of the year. So I think it's going to be a pretty good battle. And I, I officials, you know, as Chris will tell you, are always really important in games like this. It's how they're going to call it, how tight they're going to call it. Osafor is a hard guy to, to uh, officiate. I think should get your thoughts on this, Chris. But I think he's a hard guy to officiate because he falls down all the time. Like, yeah. I Those mean, I, I was really counting tough. yesterday. Yeah. Yeah. It's like. Is he, is he falling down because he doesn't have a good balance? Is he falling down because he's flopping? Is he falling down because he's getting shoved, but he's 250, 60 pounds? So I, I don't know. I mean, I think that I think the whistle is going to be big. I would honestly, I think if I'm officiating him, telling him to stop fall, tell him to stop falling down, and hopefully he gets some of that message because that you're right, it makes it easy for me to easier for me to officiate if he's not falling all the time, but that is a tough one. Uh, Mark, let me, ask, it's interesting. You mentioned the falling down. I want to ask you an interesting question. You and I kind of talk about on the side, but it is about, uh, I don't know, just the class of the behavior of players on the floor and where we're going with this. I watched Jalen house last night. I know, I know he wants to be a villain. He has to play up this role. But he was out of control again last night, screaming at the crowd, waving, blowing kisses, falling down, almost ended up getting in a fight at the end of the game with, uh, I think it was Anderson of Boise State. You uh, were doing the, the women's basketball post game the other night when uh, Desi Ray Young of UNLV, after they beat the Aztecs, basically said, we wish we could have played somebody better than them in the final. What is going on here? And should we accept this as just – you know, young kids the way they are these days, or is there something amiss a little bit? I think there's something amiss. I mean, I, I what I think is happening is that yes, there, it's a reflection of society, um, and there's a much greater tolerance of behavior. But I think we enable it too much. I think you know, in sports where you can have sort of artificial boundaries on things, I think it'd be a great example to to rein that kind of behavior in. I mean, last night I was sitting courtside, watched the whole game. I saw everything he did. Uh, in the first half, he hit a shot and he and he he gestured or said something to the to the Boise bench. And Greg Nixon was right there, veteran official. They had already teed up Leon Rice, the Boise State coach, for arguing. It was a great opportunity to sort of even the score. You've already given the, te- the team uh, for different reasons, but you've given them one. So he should have, and I think he was thinking about it, but it was earlier in the game first half and he didn't do it and he just said don't do that that's all he said okay and and you know it doesn't work with Jalen House now you've enabled him um and he just keeps going 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 and he's right on the line he's pushing it most of his gesturing was to his own fans but I just think that 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 just heats up you know opposition fan unnecessarily and you can have problems, and then you almost did at the end of the game. But I think he had the he had the opportunity there, and I bet you, if you asked him in a candid moment, he probably wished he would have teed him up because that would have stopped it all. Because now he can't do anything for fear of getting tossed and and maybe costing his team the game. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah, it's unfortunate because I I really like to watch these kids play, but I think a little class would be nice. Uh, you and I both looked at each other the other night when uh, the UNLV gal said what she said. And it was just, it was a diss on your opponent. I mean, how about a little respect for who you're playing? And I, I know we're older, Mark, but I don't think we're that old to know what the difference sometimes between right and wrong. And yeah, now, now get off my lawn. Then get <laughs> off, we'll both get off each other's lawns. Have fun tonight. Thanks so much for joining us. Quick notice. That was very kind of you. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, right, enjoy dude. the game. See you later. There Thanks, he goes. Mark. Mark Ziegler in Las Vegas. 
Aztecs, Utah State tonight, the Mountain West Conference semifinal. And then the second game, the Aztecs win and you're in the mood. You know, stick around and watch the second game because Colorado State's got great players. And Jalen House, like him or hate him, probably hate him, but it's some it's like you have to watch it. You have to watch this kid perform. I will. And I'm sure you will. Should be two really good games tonight. All right. When we come back, I've been working on this throughout the show. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> because we didn't know we were going to have a show. It doesn't matter. I've been but thinking about this for weeks, actually. I know. I probably left a couple things out. Me but too. Scraby and I are going to do a countdown that I think is – it is so up Scraby's alley, I can't even believe it. But it's going to be our top five all-time conspiracies – slash mysteries of the world slash stuff that nobody can explain. That is what we are going to count down when we come back. And if you know, it's good for you and you've ever listened to Matt Scraby, you do not want to miss this. It's I don't coming. think we have enough time. Well, we'll do it. We'll do the best we can. Okay. We'll do the best we can. We got till six o'clock. Scraby. This is so true. This is hopefully true. we can get it done in two and a half hours. Our countdown is next. Ben and
All right, welcome back to Gwen and Chris. We're actually having a pretty good show. Maybe we should just do not plan anything ever. Just not ever ever plan anything ever, yeah. We had nothing planned. We weren't planning on even being on the air today, or hardly at all. Until about uh, right now or 4 o'clock. 4 o'clock or so. But anyway, as it turned out, Padres uh, Futures game against the Mariners got rained out in Peoria. So uh, we have uh, taken over the airwaves. Chris Ello, Matt Scraby, together in our Odyssey Palace studios. Uh, Before we get to this countdown, which we are both looking forward to, uh, let's get to a couple of little scores around college basketball. So there's a lot of games, right? This is conference tournament stuff. Yeah, this uh, is r- the time for games during the day. I mean, it's day, just so games fun. Night, yeah. Games, games the during the day, yeah. UConn is playing St. John's, and that is in the Big East semifinal. UConn's the defending champs. St. John's probably is a tournament team. Uh, that's a really good first half. 52-47 UConn over St. John's at halftime. That's a lot of points. What was the score of the Aztecs last night? Like 22-28? 27-22. 27-22. So the Aztecs and UNLV combined to score 49 points. These two teams have combined to score 99 points in the first half. So we'll keep an eye on UConn St. John's. Earlier today, uh, Purdue beat Michigan State in the Big Ten I don't know if that was a semi or quarterfinal. 67-62, that was a quarterfinal. And then in the SEC, a uh, rather large upset in the quarterfinals. The nine seed, Mississippi State, beat the one seed, Tennessee, 73-56. That could end up costing Tennessee a number one seed in the NCAA tournament. It's pretty much been down to either Tennessee or Arizona for that last number one seed. And Arizona now has a chance, I think, to seize that if they can win the Pac-12. Anyway, we'll keep an eye on some of the goings-on later on. The Aztecs don't play, by the way, if you're wondering, until 6.30 tonight. And for those of you who like to stay up late watching college basketball, the Colorado State-New Mexico game doesn't start till 9 o'clock tonight. So Wait, 9 o'clock? Yeah, that's when that game starts. After the, It's after the Aztec game. I think Aztecs, I, yeah. The Aztecs play at 6.30. New Mexico, Colorado State play at 9 o'clock. They play at midnight Eastern. That's yeah. why a lot of these guys in the Mountain West Conference don't get noticed. Play the game in the middle of the night. Jerry Palm will be watching, though. Jerry Palm won't miss it. He told us yesterday. He goes, I'll be up. I'll be watching. Uh, all right, Scraby. Let's, uh, we don't have traffic today. No, we do. Oh, we do have some traffic. Yeah. Yep. Sure. All right. Kelly well, Danik has uh, Kelly Danik punched is... her, her card early, too. All right. Very good, Kelly. And uh, let's see what's happening out there, and then we'll get into today's countdown. From the 97.3 The Fan Traffic Center, here's Kelly Danik. Got a handful of problems starting us off. Got a brush fire starting up near the Plaza Boulevard on-ramp to Northbound 805. It's over the right shoulder. Collision on South 163 just before the 8. That is partially in the right lane. Looks like a handful of folks get to spend part of their weekend getting their vehicles in for some servicing on the South 163 before Claremont Mesa Boulevard. Got a stall vehicle over to the right shoulder. Also stall reported on Southbound 5 right before the 163. It's partially in the fast lane. Westbound 8 at the North 163 connector ramp stall car with right shoulder. I'm Kelly Danik with Good and Chris, San Diego's number one sports station, 97.3 The Fact. It's now time for Gwen and Chris to rank their top five of the day. Gonna grip and rip as usual. But this isn't just a regular top five list. I love it. It sounds sadistic, but I love it. This is The Countdown. And it starts right now on 97.3 The Fan. All right, we're ready. We got today's countdown topic. Uh, I broached this with Scraby a couple of weeks ago. He said that uh, he didn't want to do it right away. I needed time. Because he needed time. (laughs) He needed some time to think about his really top ones. Because, you know, asking Scraby to come up with his top five conspiracies out there is, you know, that that puts him in a bit of a box because he's got 500 conspiracies. Look at my sheet, So for you, How many changes I've made on it already. So for you to be able to narrow it down from all of the conspiracy and mystery things that are out there to just five, not going to be easy. But I know you'll do it, and uh, let's get underway. All right. Number five. You go first. I'll go go first. first. All right. I think I have kind of a fun one for the first conspiracy. Let's go. 
Now, my conspiracies, a lot of them are conspiracies that have already been proven to be wrong. But I just think they're so interesting that we can't overlook them on a countdown like this. First conspiracy for me or number five on my list, the one where Paul is dead. Paul. Paul McCartney oh, of the Beatles. He died? The rumor began circulating in 1966 okay. that he had died in a car crash and had been replaced by a lookalike. What? This was a huge conspiracy theory for three or four years. There was a Beatles album that came out where people said if you played a certain section of the album, I think it was Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, if you played the record backwards, John Lennon said, Paul is dead, Paul is dead, Paul is dead. Oh, my gosh. Oh, yeah. This was an incredible, an incredible <laughs> theory. And I think it's much like, a little bit like what's going on with the with Kate Middleton right now. Like, there was no sign of the real Paul McCartney for a, a long time. And everybody said, yeah, because he had died. Of course, we know that Paul McCartney yeah, I was still I, alive. The whole time, I'm like, wait, is he the one who? No, that was, um, who was murdered? Uh, John Lennon. John Lennon. John yes, Lennon was murdered. That, yeah. No, Paul McCartney's still very much alive. Yes. But back in the late 1960s, it was in question as to whether or not the Beatles had replaced the Great musician Paul McCartney with a lookalike. Wow. That so, would be pretty hard to do back Well, it would it be easier to do back then because there wasn't social media, yeah. but it would still be pretty hard to do. I mean, do. get this, Gravy. The rumor itself began circulating in 1966. It gained broad popularity in 1969, especially in, around I've, American college kids. So, I've I mean, never this thing was this. three or four years. Paul is dead. Yeah. That was a big wow. one. I've never heard this. I before. thought you'd like that one. That's a good one. That's my number five. Uh, all right. So my number five is actually, I, I really honestly cannot choose my five top ones, but these are the ones I've been most interested in as of late. And I'm just going to start with the most current, which is where is Kate Middleton? <laughs> and, and, and I'm being serious because at this point, I'm honestly 100% feeling worried. They have not put her in front of media or people, or anything. They keep releasing these cryptic pictures that seem to have been messed with through Photoshop, and then they say, oh, she's a, 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 a budding Photoshopped artist, and so she did the Photoshopping. That's why it's so bad. Well, then have her say that. Where is she? And I really do think that something is afoot. Something is afoot. Uh, there was a big thing on uh, my favorite show, TMZ, last night. About, about her? About where she might be. And? There were two theories. One, that whatever has really happened is worse I, I, than the palace being embarrassed by people coming up with their own theories. I agree. Because the palace knows that everybody out there is making up stuff. But the palace doesn't want to come out and say anything because whatever the real truth is, it's worse yeah. than what people are making up. Yeah, yeah. So that's, I believe it. that's one of the big theories right now. Uh, I, I, I definitely believe that. And, and the other theory is that something – there's many theories. There's a theory that uh, Charles is actually passing – or he's dying quicker than people thought. So William's going to become king and then she needs to stay out of the public eye. And or William is divorcing her. And so, he supposedly has been having an affair for a long, long time. Yes. With someone, some other duchess or whatever. Yes. Which is really strange, Chris, because he's going down the same path or she's going down the same path that Princess Diana went down. A little bit. A little and bit. It's, and it's we really know what creepy. ended up happening. To her. And I, I honestly do hope that everything's OK. But you're right, Chris. And I will make a crazy prediction. And I'm not being disrespectful to people from England. I feel like this is the end of the Royals because whatever is about to come out is going to ruin them. Wow. Yeah. That would that is a hell of a prediction, Scrape. Once the Queen died, I don't think anybody really thinks about them the same. Well, well I'm not, not only, from England. Not, so. Yeah, I know. You're going to be upsetting some people. But not only did the Queen die, but remember, you know, Prince uh, Harry oh, he and Meghan Markle just got out of the whole thing. They don't yeah. even want to be part of it. So maybe this could be the beginning of the end. We'll <sighs> see. 
number four. All right, number four on the uh, all-time conspiracy and what in the world happened list. This one freaked me out when I was a little kid. Okay. And so it still kind of freaks me out today, even though this, like the Paul McCartney one, has largely been, quote, solved. Okay. But at the time when this all first happened, all-time mystery. Okay. The disappearance of the famous female pilot, Amelia Earhart. Oh, of course. They think they found her, by the way. Well, I was going to get to oh, that. Oh, sorry, sorry, Let sorry. me tell my story. Sorry, sorry, sorry. But Amelia Earhart disappeared in July of 1937. Now, again, this is these are different times. Oh, yeah. It's almost 100 years ago. I mean, flight was new, newish at that right? time. Right. Flying was brand new. Amelia Earhart said she was going to fly around the world. She was never seen or heard from again. Mm -hmm. And nobody knew what happened. There's just something about the mystery of the name Amelia Earhart. Just hearing that yeah. gives me the willies a little bit. Like, where did she go? Yeah. Did she really crash into the ocean? But it, how did she dis? I mean, who well, knows? Aliens what the took her. We all know. Well, that. I know aliens took her. She went flying. She went up and she went up, 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 and just and kept aliens going like, up. what is this flying machine we've never <laughs> seen before? We're gonna take this. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Amelia Earhart uh, was uh, never found. They uh, claimed that some of her bones were found washed up on an island in the Pacific, but it was many, many years later that that happened. I want to just. Here's the official thing on Amelia Earhart. She was given a presumption of death finally in 1938. So that took a while. Oh, wow. And a presumption of death occurs when the person is believed to be dead despite the absence of any direct proof mm -hmm, of mm -hmm. the death. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Others in that category include Jimmy Hoffa and, believe it or not, Jack the Ripper. Nobody knows what happened to these people. I mean, Jack the Ripper was a, a murderer. So I know it's like, he was. Who cares what happened to him? Well, I, Jimmy Hoffa wasn't exactly. No, he uh, wasn't great, but legit. I get why he wasn't like going around. Well, never mind. Never I, mind. He, he, never never mind. mind. Anyway, Amelia Earhart, the all time case of what in the world happened. Yes, that's we'll never a good know. one. We'll that, never that's know. a really good one. Thank you. Uh, I got a text saying, give me a Bigfoot conspiracy. Bigfoot will not be on this because no. Bigfoot is already proven. So we All don't right. need Big to go Foot, through that. No Loch Ness Monster. No Loch Ness Monster, okay. nothing like that. All right. Uh, so my number four is going to be the incident at Dyatlov Pass. And I don't... Uh, never heard of this. Okay, so it's in Russia. And it was back in like the early days, like 60s or 70s, something like that. But these people were trying to like trek across part of Russia and they were never heard from again. So people went to go look for them. And when they got there, the scene was just like they. OK, so let me just speed this up. They think like a Yeti or an abominable snowman or some sort of thing like that, like killed them because these people were in such bad shape when they found their bodies that it could only be explained by something that was much bigger than them, oh much boy. faster than them. There's bite marks. There's blood. There's there's things everywhere. No one How knows what the heck died happened. in this. Ooh, like, Hundreds or dozens? no, like maybe like twenty okay. or so. All but right. go look at this because it's too long to really explain here. Right. But the KGB, which is the Russian CIA, yes, is very involved in covering this up as well. So what's they it called again? The Dyatlov incident. Diet Law? Yes. How do I spell that? D-Y-A-T-L-O-V. Diet Law Pass Incident. Yes. It's very crazy. Uh, 1959. There we go. Yes. yes. 1959. So what happened? Uh, there's nine hikers uh, that oh, died okay. in the uh, northern Ural Mountains. They found their tents and they found scratch marks inside of their tents like they were trying to get out of oh the tents. Oh, my God. So, like, people think something attacked them out of nowhere, and it was just much bigger than them, and they were trying to get away, and they couldn't get away, and uh, the KGB covered it up. So, I've been really reading a lot about this. There's many theories on this one. Look it up. D-Y-A-T-L-O-V. Diet Love. Diet Love. Yeah, it's pretty interesting. I'm just reading a little bit now. Number three. All right, number three for me, we're never going to make this by the top of the I hour. know, we're not. But it's okay, because we're just, the, yes. the show is on the on the lamb today anyway. Yes. And uh, if we had done this with Tony involved, it would take three hours. So here we go. My number three, uh, I don't know, conspiracy, mystery, whatever. Very simple. 
Area 51. Thought about this one long and hard. Did you? I just don't know what's there. And nothing. nobody seems to know what's there. Nothing. You think nothing's there. The new theory is that so many people know about Area 51 now. It's not a secret. And they have moved everything from Area 51 ah, to a different location. Okay. Well, but all right. But, so it's but still I, part of yes, the Area yes, 51. Correct. You know, mystery. I, no, I don't take away from your theory because I don't know that to be fact. Okay. But yeah, uh, Area 51 nobody understands. Crazy. Nobody understands what goes on there. There's a million reports of UFOs, yeah. aliens. Oh, yeah. All kinds of nuclear testing. Yeah. And apparently Area 51 is located in what? Nevada? It is in Nevada, yes. It is in Nevada. Yes. There's like a little it, town outside. Oh. <laughs> no. Is it impossible for somebody to just fly a helicopter yes. over there and take pictures? You will be shot down. You would just be killed. Yes. <laughs> How about a drone? They will shoot that down. Chris, you will not get any. I didn't say I was going to try. I'm just trying to figure out how something like this is going on, and nobody knows. Like, how did everyone – everyone's kept this a secret for over 70 years as to what happens there? Well, I thought I, – I listened to a podcast about Area 51 in the last year or so, and there was a guy who, who worked there and says that he had clearance to see some of the things that they were testing, and it's mostly military testing. But one of the things that he saw that would really freak him out – was a full on like transformer where someone gets into this transformer thing and it's like 50 feet tall and you could just stomp on anything you want. It's just one person in this big old robot <laughs> and they're testing this. To, and they're also testing like anti gravity stuff. What do they call that transformer? Shaquille O'Neal? <laughs> yeah, it's like, or <laughs> Zach Eady or something. Yeah. Uh, but they're testing like anti gravity stuff where they can shoot a beam at people and it will take gravity away from them so that they can't move. Oh my God. All right. But that, yeah. Anyway. All right. Anyway. So Area 51 just in general is a mystery. So yes, I had to it get is. it on my list. It is. All right. My number three, I don't think many people have heard about, but it is. it really creeps me out. But it's the di disappearance of Chris Kremers and Lisa Ann Fr Froon from Panama. Now, these, these two were... Exactly. Christopher these, Kremers? No, Chris Kremers and Lisa Ann Froon. Well, I want to look it up. How do you spell Kremers? Uh, K-R-E-M-E-R-S. But they went to Panama as backpackers. And there they, we are, Chris Kremers and yeah. Lisa Ann Froon. So they, they went to Panama as backpackers and they went for like two a, young ladies, by the way. Yes. You yes the from, well, when you say the name Chris, people probably assume it's a man and I a think woman. It's from the Netherlands ladies. or uh, one I'll of look those. this up. Okay. They, they happened on April 1st, 2014. They were hiking on a trail in Panama. And so they get lost. They can't find their way out. And okay. they sent a search party for these people and they could never find them and it took months and months and months to find things but when they did find them they found all of their clothes they found their backpack they found their shoes they found the actual bones but what they found that creeps me out more than anything is a camera of undeveloped film so they developed the film and the they had to take pictures as they walked through the the uh, jungle chris because they couldn't see anything and on the second roll of film it's a horror movie it's basically them with blood on them, and no one really knows what in the world happened. They think the theory is is that a few uh, natives from the jungle that you know are not part of civilization saw them, got them, and sacrificed them. And the families are still trying to find out what happened. But this creeps me out to no end because you can see some of these pictures, and it's them just taking pictures in the forest or the jungle so that they can get the flash to see for a half second. It's really creepy. I got to say. I got to say. You're pretty crazy, Scraby. You love this stuff. It's pretty creepy. All right. If those are the only numbers five, four, and three, what could still be ahead <laughs> in numbers two and one? <laughs> I hate to say I love Chris versus the fans, but I'm enjoying this more. I, I think I like this too. So we're going we're gonna to finish this countdown. The top five conspiracy slash mysteries. So you've opened my eyes to a couple of them now. I feel I like I'm going to let people down by one and two, but I have a very strong reasoning for them. Well, I don't. you haven't let us down so far. Okay. I hope I haven't let anybody down. No. I've no, had some no. fun stuff, yeah. I hope. Yes. I guarantee you my number one story is going to crack you up to no end, and you're okay. not going to believe it. <laughs> All right. Gwen and Chris continues with more on this. Uh, wasn't supposed to be a show Friday. <laughs> like 97.3 that. The Fan.
All right, here we go. Four o'clock hour show that wasn't supposed to exist. Does it really exist? Ooh. I don't know. It could be a conspiracy. Wow. Did they really play the Padres futures game today? And we just decided not to carry the game, but it's actually being played. No, no, we wouldn't be here, Chris. We wouldn't that do that. Case. We would not do that. Uh, welcome into Gwen and Chris. Uh, it is a surprising four o'clock show or a four hour show today. We're supposed to be off because the uh, Padres futures game against the Mariners, we were going to carry it on the radio with Sam Levitt handling the play by play. But that did not happen because the game was rained out, unfortunately. So. Uh, not much we can do about that. Uh, we are hanging on uh, here until 6 o'clock in its place. And uh, we're not going to do Chris versus the fans today because we don't – this is a show that we didn't really have lined up. We didn't prepare. Scraby honestly, does, I didn't even write questions. Scraby has no questions. <laughs> I mean, we're just – we honestly, both Scraby and I were kind of, you know, informed officially – like what a you know five minutes before not five but you know what I mean like one o'clock yeah one o'clock just enough time to get down we, here we were aware but I honestly didn't let that even cross my I mind I didn't expect it to happen I really thought that Me they too. would play the game today Me too but they didn't play it so uh, we're on but no, no Chris versus the fans if you're dialing in uh, relax today we're gonna uh, we'll play another Chris versus the fans on Monday but Scraby and I are having some fun oh yeah uh, we are counting down the top five conspiracy slash mysteries mysteries of all time uh, to recap my number five was Paul is dead having to do with the uh, famous uh, rumor that Paul McCartney was actually dead when he, of course he's not which is one I've never heard before you'd never heard that so never. I'm glad I enlightened you uh, my number four was Amelia Earhart, her disappearance, and uh, subsequent never finding anything about Amelia uh, Earhart. I got a, a, a an addition to that conspiracy theory on the chat, which was that people were afraid that she was going to figure out the Earth was flat, and so they got rid of her before she could tell everyone. Ah, that's which is a fun. It's a, a, a fun good, twist. Good little twist. Or either that, or maybe the world, the Earth is flat, and she just flew off the end. There we go. There we go, there Kyrie we Irving. Go. There we go, Kyrie Irving. And that guy from Texas A&M. <laughs> yeah, he'd be happy to know. Uh, number three for me was just, in general, Area 51, which mm. is it's mystery. creepy. It's creepy. Scraby, what's your recap of your 543? My number five was, where is Kate Middleton? You're worried about that, for and I, sure. I, it, you know, people say, you shouldn't be so like crass about Kate Middleton. I am not. I'm spreading the word so that we can put some pressure on these Royals to, to figure it to out. To fill us in. Yes. My number four was the incident at Diet Love Pass, which was kind of like a Yeti incident from Russia in 1959. What happened to the nine people that went hiking and were basically torn apart by... I read... We don't know what. I read in the break that um, someone was found in that group without a tongue. Just without a tongue. That's painful. Yes. My number three was the disappearance of Chris Kremers and Lisa Ann Fraun from uh, they went to Panama. They got lost in the jungle and they were never found. Well, they were found again, but they were found in in pieces and they were the cameras were found and there was pictures of them and they oh. were they were in danger and they were bleeding. Yeah, and that's a so people freaky. think that a jungle tribe found them and sacrificed them. We don't know. I'm but sorry, we don't to all know the for kids sure. out there. Right I know, now. no kidding. This is the adult uh, version of the Gwen versus Chris. All right, number two, uh, we need an official. Oh, my bad. Number two. Thank you. Number two for me, uh, very simple. Uh, John F. Kennedy. Jr. Wow. Just number two. Uh, John, John F. Kennedy. Yeah, I put another one ahead of it because it has sports ties, but this one is just the all time conspiracy and mystery. And I think we've gone over it so many times on this show that we don't really need to go over it again. Do we really need to go into it one more time, Chris? We've had some pretty long conversations. That's what I'm saying. I, that's why I'm saying and we're not going into it. But I, JFK is just, you know, auto, automatically, you know, brings out, you know, theories from, you know, every angle. And just about everybody has a different theory. Right? I yes. mean, you can listen to Rob Reiner or you can listen to... You know the pat the fact that the mur the me the mafia murdered him, or you can watch the Oliver Stone film with the CIA behind everything. Yeah, or you can believe that just there was a lone gun incident, which I just 
I increasingly have trouble believing, but mm. I know it's still a possibility. What else, anyway. Chris? What else? Oh, I don't know. There's a few dozen more, I'm sure. It's JFK number two for me, but it just that's the uh, the conspiracy, the gift that keeps on giving if you are a conspiracy fan. I guess so. Yeah. I guess so. I'm trying to find the name of this doll. I just gave away my number two. Oh, um, oh Peggy the doll. It, it, Peggy the doll is actually in a Las Vegas. Um, have you ever heard of you? I guarantee you haven't. But his name's Zach Baggins. And he's like a ghost guy. And so he has a bunch of TV shows. And he also owns a museum of all these different. Peggy the haunted doll. Oh, don't look at a picture. Ah! No, seriously. All right. People say that if you look at a picture of Peggy the doll, something bad will happen to you. It doesn't mean you're going to die. It doesn't mean that you're going to get hurt. It means maybe you spill your drink outside or something like that. Chris is looking for his drink right now, making sure it's not I just spilling. looked at a picture of her. Now I'm in trouble. But they, Peggy the doll is in this museum, and people go in to see her. And okay. whenever they see her, everyone, and I'm sure it's just the feel that you get when you walk in there, but everyone says when they look at her, you feel evil enter your body ah! and you also can like get attached to it some people say they have bad luck following them for months after someone said that they saw the doll on tv one time and the doll has haunted them ever since okay so peggy the doll also if we're gonna stay with dolls robert the doll <laughs> is very creepy looking <laughs> you can look at a picture of robert the doll i'm allowed to look at a picture of robert the yeah, doll robert the doll is very creepy looking really but he is also in a museum the doll and it's a haunted doll and it will apparently change facial expressions it'll make giggling sounds as you walk by it uh other things like that but robert the doll is very creepy very creepy are you looking at a picture of robert the doll uh, <laughs> no yes all right i just saw robert the doll i can't believe you even know about this stuff uh my podcast that i listened to was talking about it like a month Big ago on robert the doll <laughs> number one well they did a whole haunted doll episode and they were making fun of all the dolls but one guy said he went to go see peggy the doll and he's like i'm not scared of anything but that doll scared me and i believe him all right the number one conspiracy theory of all time in my mind has to do with the great game of baseball. And it has to do with one of the greatest records in the history of the sport. There's a conspiracy. A record that will never be broken. Okay. I'm pretty sure that you've heard this story, so don't wreck it for those who haven't. All right, Scrape? Okay. The all-time record for most consecutive games played in the history of the sport, one of the greatest records ever is held by Cal Ripken Jr., 2,632 consecutive games played. It is revered. It is honored. And everybody who watches sports feels that is one of the greatest, most unbreakable records of all time. Here is the conspiracy theory about oh, how yes. he set that yes, record. This is fantastic. Cal Ripken broke Lou Gehrig's record in 1995. Only prior to that, about two years earlier, Cal Ripken Jr. was on his way to the ballpark in Baltimore one, one night. Forgot his glove. Forgot something. Back at home. Yeah. Earlier that day, Kevin Costner, a good friend of Ripken's, had been over at the house and been playing Wait, some ping pong. Kevin Costner and Cal Ripken just hanging out together? Yeah, they were hanging out okay. together. That shouldn't be surprising. That's weird. That shouldn't be surprising. That is very surprising that what, Cal Ripken's baseball, hanging out with Kevin Costner. Baseball players, actors, they run in the same okay. circles. They're playing ping pong, some one-on-one -on -one in the backyard. Ripken comes back to the house to pick up whatever he forgot. Oops! Finds Kevin Costner. What? In bed oh, no. with Cal Ripken's wife. Oh, no. A struggle ensues. Wait, a struggle between Cal Ripken Jr. and Kevin Costner? Yes, this ensues. Is amazing. Cal Ripken Jr. is injured in the struggle. He's also mentally broken up. Of course. He's seen his, his wife, wife in bed with another man. Yes, uh, Kevin Costner nonetheless. You can't ever watch a Kevin Costner movie again. Cal Ripken Jr. calls the Orioles. Says... Sorry, I'm not playing tonight. I can't play. I'm hurt. I hurt my shoulder in this scrum. My mentally, I got to get through this with my wife. 
the Orioles are like apoplectic. Like you can't, can't the miss this die? game. The streak. You've got the streak, Cal. You can't miss a game. Ripken is like, not coming. Not coming. Well, I don't blame him. Yeah, I don't either. He says, my my own, my own entire life is more important than this. The Baltimore Orioles, look it up. In 1993, in August, had a game with the Seattle Mariners that was canceled due to a power outage. Oh, cool. air quotes. Air quotes around power outage. The Orioles claimed that there was a power outage in the stadium. They could not play the game that night. Hmm. Did the lights <laughs> turn on great the next time? Evidently, <laughs> the next night, they turned back on. Ripken was over it, his problem, and he was back in the lineup. It's a quick and recovery from that, continued. Cal Ripken. <laughs> and I've been told that story by so many different people that I believed it to be true. And I heard it from people way up in organized, you know, people that were in baseball. The, the, I mean, it was yeah. the deal. The reason I've learned I, I learned about this is because, like you said, people in baseball who are not conspiracy theorists are like, this is what happened. This is what happened. Cal Ripken would never have broken the record if it wasn't for the fact the Orioles came up with the idea to say that the uh, electricity went out. Anyway, this he, is this has now been debunked four or five hundred different ways. Uh, one of the ways it's been debunked is that there are photos from the game that night before the uh, power failure, okay. and Ripken was apparently there at the stadium. So this has been pretty much debunked. Kevin Costner's basically threatened to physically harm anybody else out there who claims that this is still true. Says he barely even knows Cal Ripken's wife, barely knows Cal Ripken. This is a total... I thought their friendship was real. Their friendship could be more real. I don't know. I think it happened. You think it did happen? Huh? I mean, do they have definitive proof? The definitive proof to me is that there's a picture from the stadium that night. How do you know it was from that and night? And that Ripken was there. What if it was like an unreleased picture? Maybe it was. All right. Well, you go ahead and believe the conspiracy theory. It's fun to believe it, though. It is. It totally That is. one of baseball's greatest records may have never happened. Because yeah, because that is a great story. It really is. It's a fun story. All right, my number... really, I just want to be clear to everybody that it's pretty much been proven now to be untrue. Pretty much been All proven. Right. It's been proven to be untrue. <laughs> you can't say that with fact. I'm All saying right. it with fact. Honorable mention for my there number one. There are photos one. of Cal Ripken's wife with Kevin Costner in bed. The photos reside in Area 51. Okay. So you'll have to get in there to By see By the them. way, someone on Twitter messaged us, Chris, and said about Area 51, I'm assuming, I work there, gentlemen. Uh -huh. Allegedly. Uh, might, I hope so. Might need to hit you up later. Yeah, not later, now. <laughs> <laughs> All right, my number, I, I got to give you uh, my, the reason that I love creepy stuff, the reason that I watch horror movies, the reason that I listen to all these podcasts is because the Zodiac Killer took the, his first victims, and this is not my number one, but the Zodiac Killer took his first victims about 10 minutes away from the house that I grew up in. And I went there to the scene a couple times. And most recently, I went back to the scene, Chris, like a year ago when I was back there. So I go, there, there's this whole thing, and it was 10 minutes away. So I was always fascinated by this. They never caught the Zodiac Killer. And so that's why I'm into all this stuff. But my actual number one. The Zodiac Killer was a movie, was it not? It was called Zodiac. It wasn't yeah. a movie. It was about the guy. But, right. but this no, guy said in. Yeah, it was a movie. Yeah, for sure. But they never found this guy. They never to really found day? it. They still, to this day, like put theories forward. But everybody who's involved is now dead or like, right. they're, they've been cleared. So they really don't know who this guy is. And he actually, like I said, 10 minutes away from where I grew up killed his first victims way before I'm I was looking there. at a uh, at a, a sketch of supposed sketch of the Zodiac killer he's kind of dorky looking isn't he a little dorky looking but then he changes his his look and he puts he has a hood over himself and he also has like a vest on and it becomes very scary when the Zodiac yeah anyway all right, why don't you hang on before you give us your number one story oh my gosh this because is gonna be a three are, segmenter this is a three segmenter we're way over time Okay. We need to check some traffic. Someone oh. said you're the Zodiac killer, by the way. Me or Scrape? <laughs> you. Me. 
Wow, that's pretty nice. I don't know. think I don't think Chris was. Chris can't. He doesn't. This have happened a in the late. Si- in this body. all happened in the late '60s. I was barely born, so it's pretty hard for me to be the Zodiac killer. Yeah, true. More Gwen and Chris and Scraby's number one conspiracy theory, which <laughs> promises to be a doozy, on 97.3 The Fan.
a little sports here for you. Uh, number one, Houston Cougars lead Texas Tech early going of the uh, Big 12 tournament semifinal. And Houston's off to a good start here. They lead 17-5 to over Texas Tech in the first half. Also, second-ranked UConn leading St. John's, 9.32 to go second half, 73-63. UConn is good. They're really good. They get challenged. They pull away in the second half. The other games, they don't even get challenged. <laughs> I mean, they're going to be tough to beat. They're going after back-to-back titles. Maybe that's bad for them. Maybe they need some challenges. I don't know if anybody is good enough to, <laughs> to keep up with them. them you know, <laughs> They're only ranked number two, but I, I still think they're the team to beat. Purdue, the third-ranked team, beat Michigan State today in the Big, Tw- Big Ten or big, yeah, Big Ten quarterfinal, 67 62. Fourth ranked North Carolina is trailing in the early going ACC semifinal. It is Pittsburgh 17, North Carolina 10. Or uh, later, Aztecs, Utah State in the Mountain West Conference semifinal, followed by New Mexico against Colorado State. All right, Scraby and I have been doing a countdown since 3 30. <laughs> and- oh, wait, sorry. I meant to do it's this. My time. bad. There we go. Un- impromptu show. Can't be blamed for it. Can't be blamed for anything today. We weren't even <laughs> supposed to do a show today, so we put one together for you. Uh, we're doing our top five uh, all-time conspiracies, mysteries. My list included the death of Paul McCartney, the uh, disappearance of Amelia Earhart, Area 51, JFK, and the Cal Ripken, My Kevin Costner. of them all. Yeah, it is a great one. Uh, so those are my top five conspiracies. Scraby has come up with a widely, wide-ranging list of conspiracies and things. Yes. And he's arrived at number one here. Well, first I have to give some credit to the chat because they are throwing some conspiracy theories out there. Caveman said, look up the mystery of D.B. Cooper. I have, I, I know all about D.B. Cooper. He also played professional baseball. Did you know that? D.B. Cooper? Yes. I did not. Maybe like minor league baseball. Okay. But yeah, D.B. Cooper, he hijacked the plane and he supposedly parachuted out of the plane. They never found him and he stole a bunch of money. Stole a bunch of money. Yeah, yeah. that was the thing. He uh, hijacked a flight after he had uh, robbed a bank or something. He had a big cache of uh, cash. Cache of cash. Cache of cash. They never found him. No, no, they never did. Disappeared. I love it. That's what it, that's what it says on his bio on Wikipedia. Disappeared November 24th, 1971. He didn't really disappear, 52 though. 52 years ago, status missing, unidentified. He didn't go missing, though, because he himself took himself somewhere in this world. He didn't go missing. He's not disappeared. He's he knows missing exactly to the rest of is. us. I know. He knows where that, he, that one bothers he, me because he knows he, where he is. It was it was his choice. It but we don't choice. know where he is. No one kidnapped him or anything like that. Oh, so. Okay. Uh, another real quick one: the aliens built the pyramids, but I'm not getting into that today. I that's, would. That's a theory I've never even heard. Really? The aliens built the pyramids. How do you think that they built those things back in the day with no heavy machinery or anything to help them other than humans pulling up big stones how do they build anything with heavy machinery and cranes day. what heavy machinery and cranes did they have in they did 1901 That's what I'm saying. when they were building the likes of the empire state building and stuff were aliens doing that too no because we have pictures of humans making it but the, the eiffel pyramids. tower went up how did they do that i mean there's also pictures of people making yes, the power what there was no photographs back in the days when the Egyptians were building the pyramids. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm not going to believe in aliens. Sorry, All right. Scrabe. All right. Um, How do you think they got built? Like, you say that like, oh, well, yeah, yeah, yes, you must be right. It is definitely the aliens who built the pyramids. All right, my number one. There's a great, great, great Netflix documentary on this. It's a three-part series that puts uh, three different conspiracy theories to the test in this one. Okay. Malaysia Flight 370. Malaysia Flight. This You've heard recently, of this, Chris. wasn't oh, it? I think it was like maybe 2012, something okay. like that. But this this flight took off from Kuala Lumpur going to, I think, Beijing or somewhere in China. Okay. And uh, about an hour and a half in, it, they, everybody lost contact with the plane. The transponders went off. And they never found this plane. 
They have never found if it crashed, if it landed somewhere. They have no idea where this plane is. They've never seen any of the passengers have shown up. No, it, but they say they found some some debris that came from that was showed up on some island in the Indian Ocean, but they can't really for sure say it was from that plane. But here's uh, my conspiracy theory, Chris, and then I'll go into the other conspiracy theory. All right. My conspiracy theory is that someone hijacked this plane and it's sitting somewhere in this world waiting for something bad to happen. Like someone's waiting to use it for something bad to happen. That's my conspiracy theory. What did they do with the people that were on board? The people that are waiting with the plane for something Take your bad guess. to happen. Take your best Kill guess. them all. Yes. Wow. I mean, if you're going to use the plane for something nefarious, you're probably not caring about those people anyway. So somebody hijacked this flight. Flew it to parts unknown and just have it sitting there waiting to... Outfitting it, waiting for people to forget about it. And then all of a sudden, boom, this plane will be back and we'll be like... Running yeah. scared from it. I, I think so. It's 10 years ago that this happened, by the way. Oh, so 2014. Okay. Yeah. Um, the uh, other conspiracy theories from this show are that the pilot himself did this as a, a, a um, an act of suicide, basically taking everybody else out. Because when they went to his house and they checked the flight simulator that he had at his house, there were coordinates for the middle of the ocean saved into his flight simulator. So they think maybe he practiced this route. Maybe he did something like that. Mm -hmm. Final one. I don't believe this one, but this guy staked his entire career on this theory, Chris. And there was, there were two, there were two groups, one group that kicked this guy out and the other group that was the guy. And he says that Russians hijacked the plane from underneath it, depressurized the cabin and then they were able to go up to the to the uh, cockpit and take the plane and take it back to Russia. I don't believe that one. They're saying that they plugged into the computer below the plane. Boeing says there's no way to fly the plane without being in the cockpit. People say there is a way to fly the plane from the computer, but I don't believe that one. So. Number two is what I would pick if I had to choose one of those three. The pilot? Yeah. Yeah, unfortunately, I think the pilot is probably That's a really right. scary thing, though, isn't it? Uh, incredibly scary. I mean, I don't think about it ever, but it's crossed my mind before. Well, there was. We're right. all in a flight. We're pretty much at the whim of that pilot. Yeah. We pretty much are. There isn't a whole. I mean, we don't know. We, we don't a, even say hi to that person anymore. We, we have never no talk idea what to them. We never like. see them. Yeah, uh, Joseph in, says on the chat, complete command of our lives for that time. What about uh, what about airplane parts on Reunion Island? That was definitely mentioned in the documentary, but they're saying that it could be parts from that plane, but they're not saying it is a part from that plane. So there we go. Malaysian Airlines Flight 370, Do uh, Netflix document documentary. Do you know what that's called, Scrabby? So people can check it I out. I think it's MH370 or what happened to MH370. Just type in MH370. It'll be there. MH370. Yeah. All right. Wow. That was exhausting, but exhilarating at the same time, Chris. I love that. I really enjoy that. Can we go I, home now? I don't, I don't know. If, yeah, we can go <laughs> home now. I don't think we can top that. I don't think we can top that either. We're going to try. Big Five is next on Gwen and Chris.
All right, here we go. 4.36 is the time. Chris Ello, Matt Scraby together in our Odyssey Palace studios today. It is Gwen and Chris. Tony Gwynn Jr., we're still efforting to locate him. We know he's in Seoul, South Korea, but... They did not disappear. They made it there. We did. They, yes, they did make it there. They did not meet with uh, uh, some, uh, uh, you know, terrible fate. No, let's... Knock on wood everywhere. But we are struggling to uh, we are struggling to maintain communication with Tony Gwynn Jr. We uh, hope to have him on the show with us on Monday. They are in Korea. They will play next Wednesday morning at 3 a.m. Hopefully many of you will join us for that game. We're going to uh, have a watch party down at uh, Seven Mile Casino. Ben and Woods are going to host. Scraby and I are planning to be there. I'm going to be there. Chris, we'll see. I'll be there. He's going to be there now that he said it so many times. Well, why you're saying I'm not going to be there? Just because it's fun to say it right. and annoy you, I guess. Uh, check a little traffic here. Boy, that conspiracy thing was fun. But I think everybody can kind of get behind that. I also have some more on the MH370. Just real quick, Chris, that I forgot that someone, Derek, in the chat reminded me of. What's that? There were also some scientists on MH370 that had a cure for something or they had some big breakthrough. Uh, mm -hmm. And the world needed to stop it so that they can keep making their money. So there you go. So that's why it was killed. Yeah. That's, that's why, why it was down. brought shot down. Yeah. All right. That's a good one. I, I, you know, look, anything's possible. I mean, it's possible that Paul McCartney really did die. And his I don't think so. We've his seen him. His replacement has just been his replacement ever since. I mean, like I said, anything is <clears throat> possible <laughs> all right let's go to uh some traffic in today's big five Oh, man, the conspiracy theories keep... Sorry, I need to turn this down before I keep yelling because Katrina told me that they found pieces also a part of this documentary, and then I promise I'll shut up about this. This guy keeps finding pieces of the plane all over the world, but no one else in the world can find him. He goes for a swim or he goes uh, and eats lunch on an island and he finds a new piece of plane. He's the only one. He's the only one, so Interesting. it's kind of a uh, little strange. But... MH370. Check it out for yourself. Yes. Thank you, Katrina. All right. I will move on from this until the Scraby Show in a full hour. Number five. Just kidding. Michael A. Taylor has reportedly decided to sign with the Pittsburgh Pirates for $4 million, and he is off the board for the Padres. However, someone on the chat earlier when we were talking about this and Chris said, you know what? Not a big deal. He's off the board. Whatever. He, he may have helped or not. Doesn't matter. However, someone pointed out he hit 21 home runs last year. I basically said he sucks. I, know. Is what <laughs> I, I didn't basically want to say said. that. Yeah. He hit 21 home runs last year. He hit 220 last year in 129 games last season. Mm -hmm. So, Chris, do you think he would have been better than we are giving him credit for? Maybe a little bit. But I, as I said at the time, I, I didn't realize he hit 21 home runs last year. Uh, most of his career, he hits nine, five. He's had a season of one, six, seven. So that's what I expect from Michael A. Taylor. I don't expect 21. But even if he hits 21, we've already seen this before. We had Trent Grisham. So I see no reason to get another guy that maybe hits 20 home runs and bats 220 and strikes out every other at bat. Um, 
let the uh, I, I'd rather go with the young guys than spend four million dollars on Michael A. Taylor. So Pirates got him. Pirates enjoy. Pirates enjoy. Yeah. Uh I I think yes, we may have been a little bit too hard on him, but he also had an OPS of 720, which isn't the greatest OPS. If you're hitting 21 home runs, yeah, you better have an OPS of that. But look at every other year, Scrape. 670, 650, 670, 660, yeah. 640. He's not he's not great. He drove in 51 runs, yeah. 13 uh, stolen bases. If so, you look at his career in 10 years, he's had nine years where he couldn't hit and last year where he was decent. And last year was his second worst on base percentage of his career. So anyway, I, yeah, I think I, I'm happy. It would have been a wire in him. my opinion. I'm happy to let the Pirates have him. All right. Number four. Harold Reynolds, friend of the show. We haven't had him on. We need to get him on. Soon. Yeah, he's an ex-friend of the show. Oh, because we haven't <laughs> we had him haven't on lately? Him on about five years. <laughs> Every time we try, Harold, he's always doing TV because he's one of the busiest people I think I, I see in sports. But Busy guy. Harold Reynolds was asked on MLB Network to predict where he thinks Blake Snell is going to go once he is signed. And here is that exchange with Matty Vaskersian. Where do you put him? Give me one team. Give me a home. Give me a suitor. I got the Giants. Okay. San Fran or Seattle, those are the two teams, but I'll, I'll say Giants because I said them first. So he doesn't really know, but he's saying the Giants. And my question to you, Chris, now is because Blake Snell has held out, as or I guess not held out, but because he's without a team for as long as he has, he's not going to be ready for opening day. He's probably not going to be ready until the end of the first month. But do you think the team that ultimately signs him is going to get the best version of Blake Snell? Well, the one thing you got to remember about Blake is even when he starts the season on time, he starts slowly, right? Last year, True. he was really bad until the end of May. Yeah. So you might get a good half a season from him. The problem is, you know, and what he's holding out for is a half a season of him is it's expensive. That's really expensive, but it's really good. You're going to, I think you're going to get a great Blake Snell. He's going to have a lot to prove. Even though he's won two Cy Young awards, he doesn't want to. He doesn't want to get a huge contract and then not live up to it. True. So, you know, I'm hopeful for him that he winds up getting what he's after. Certainly well deserved. He's pitched like a guy that earned the big, biggest, big, exactly. you know, contract. I hope he gets it. I would really not want to see him in San Francisco, though. Let's be honest. I, I don't no. want him pitching here every third day. Against the Padres. But I will say so, the Giants. You know, I was fine with the Yankees. Seems like, you know, they need him now that Garrett Cole is probably out for a long time. Yeah, yeah. The story today, by the way, was that Cole's not going to need uh, Tommy John surgery. So that's good. The bad is he's going to miss they two months. They don't know when he's coming back. Yeah. So they might have to go get Blake Snow. Also, Blake Snell, like coming into a new team late like this, it's not easy. It's definitely not easy. So I can't even remember my question, honestly, but I think it was, is the team going to get the best version of him? I, I don't think this year they're going to get the best version of him because he's going to have to do so much to get ready for the season. I mean, he might be throwing on the side and all that stuff, but it's not the same. And like you said, Chris, that was a great point because I didn't think about that. He does start slow every year and he warms himself up. So yeah, maybe you'll get him as a great starting pitcher in August, September, and October. But, yeah, but that, can a lot, that can a lot of times be enough. If you got a good team, you hang in first few months. Blake Snell pitches lights out the last two and a half months. You can win a division. I guess you're right. I guess you're right. But Giants, they're throwing money out everywhere and seeing what happens with it. So if they throw out money to Blake Snell, I think it's a win for Padres fans because they're throwing out money at Blake Snell. Okay. Number three. Now, yesterday during the Players' Championship, which is the fifth major on the PGA Tour, which I don't even care to say that anymore because I'm so down on the PGA Tour. That's right. I'm not even going to argue with you anymore. About <laughs> because that. we're so, yeah. Rory McIlroy versus Jordan Spieth yesterday. So Rory had some two very interesting uh, shots that went out of bounds. And on both of them, there was some sort of rules exchange between Jordan Spieth and his, or, uh, Rory McIlroy and his playing partners based over where Rory McIlroy could drop the ball. So if it goes into the water and it crosses a red line, that's a lateral hazard. So if it bounces, like, say, on the piece of wood over the red line, you can drop the ball right at that red line. 
But otherwise, you have to determine where the ball entered the water, and that's where you drop it. And so it's up to the players. And Rory thought, my ball definitely hit over that line. I'm going to drop it right here. Jordan Spieth said, I can't guarantee that. I can't say that you did the right thing. So I'm going to argue this. Then Rory asked his uh, playing partner, other playing partner, Victor Hovland, who's his friend. Victor Hovland said, I can't say for sure if it hit over the line. So they bring the rules guy over. They talk about it. It takes forever. And then after Rory McIlroy said he doesn't blame Jordan Spieth for this because he's just trying to protect the game. But is there a question somewhere? I don't know what the question is, to be honest. Who do Chris. I hate more, Jordan no. Spieth or Rory McIlroy? Because that's an easy no, one. No, 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 no. I Should, can answer here, that Here one. it is. Here it is, because I was thinking about this earlier. Should rules decisions like this be put on the players only? No. They should have an official there to sort it out. Well, they do, but the official wasn't there to actually see the shot. And TV usually helps, but TV didn't even get the shot as well. Well, I think you have a, you know, you start getting to the point where there's a rules official on every hole. How tough is that? That's not tough. Okay. That's not so tough at simple. all. That's my that's my solution. I think golf has a long way to go with these sorts of things. Like Chris has finally talked me into the scorecard signing thing being wrong and you're disqualified. I think that's too harsh. We I keep my score on my phone these days. Everybody keeps their score digitally. Yeah. So I think that's okay because they keep their score digitally. This though, this is inexcusable to not have video of this. This is the players. This is one of the Oh, there was no video of it. There's no video because oh. the TV wasn't all there right. in time. You know what? With all due respect to you, Jordan Spieth, you want a perfect game of golf. Drop the ball and hit it. Well, that was Rory. I mean, it was Rory. All right. Drop the ball and hit it. It's still a 275-yard shot from the rough somewhere. You know? I do know. Big deal. But I guess if this was Patrick Reed, we would be crying a different tune. I don't know. Golf is just dumb. Okay, you didn't need to say that. <laughs> you didn't need to go. There. Do what speaking, I do. Speaking do of the what guy who I plays do. every week now. Do what I do. Walk over where the ball kind of might be. Drop another one and hit it and play on, people. <laughs> Got other things to do. I think with $25 million purse, it's a little bit different for those yeah, guys. It could be right. Number two. Uh, Juwan Howard is out at Michigan. The Wolverines announced today they are parting ways with the Fab Five legend. He has been Michigan's head men's basketball coach for the past five seasons. The athletic director said this in a statement. After a comprehensive review of the program, I have decided that Juwan will not return as our men's basketball coach. He is among the greatest Wolverines to ever be associated with our basketball program. I know how much it meant. I'm not even going to read the rest. Blah, blah, blah. It's a bunch of blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Uh, he were, is one of the greatest players who ever played here. Unfortunately, he's not he one of the greatest coach. coaches. Yeah. <laughs> they were 8-24 and 24 this year, and yeah. I believe he led them to a championship game, didn't he? Uh, boy, he got close if he didn't get all the way to the last game. Maybe a final game. four or yeah. something. I think they were in the championship. I'm going to check this out. But uh, anyway, I remember – here's the question, and I'm up first. Is Juwan Howard going to be remembered more for antics off the court? Oh, you mean like the time he pushed an official and or he whatever threw he did. a water bottle on the court and, and things like that? I don't think like he's going to be remembered for much of anything as a that's coach. That's the first. Okay, all right, that's a fair answer. That's that's kind of my feeling on Juwan. He's he, you know, we kind of know a little bit more about him here, right? Because he played for Steve Fisher, and we have that connection a little bit. But yeah, Juwan Howard, you know, really good player in college, very good player in the NBA, and a guy who coached a little while. I think that's kind of the story All right. for Jawan Howard. I remember those things. Okay. Just because I don't know much about Jawan Howard in Michigan except for what I saw. But I'm not saying he's a bad person or anything. He's not a bad one. He's, he's, a, he's a competitor. He's yes. a competitor. Yes. Sometimes he lost his cool. I, I, that's, I get that. All right. Final. I've lost my cool with you before. And I've lost my cool with you before. So there you have it. Uh, finally, I know this is going to make everybody happy out there. The Los Angeles Chargers have, in my opinion, chargered. They traded wide receiver Keenan Allen to the Chicago Bears in exchange for a 2024 fourth-round pick. Also, Mike Williams was released earlier in the year, so they saved $20 million more. This is purely cap stuff, so they're just trying to move around money. Uh, but the question here, Chris, is do you think the Chargers will regret this? Keenan Allen went to the Bears. He went to the Bears. Yeah, that's a big deal. Is it not? Uh, I mean, yeah. I mean, are you going to take Tyreek Hill away from Tua? 
I mean, is that not going to be a big deal? Keenan Allen is the number one target for uh, Justin Herbert. He has 100 catches. Easy. I'm sorry, Justin Herbert. I know he's the greatest quarterback who's ever strapped pads on, but he still better have somebody out there to throw to. And if you got rid of Mike Williams and you got rid of Keenan Allen and the kids you drafted from TCU last year Quentin was a Johnson. big, fat waste of time. Quentin Johnson, yeah. Right? Uh, who do they have to throw to? I don't know. I mean, how stupid are you to have a great quarterback and then not give him – take away all his weapons? That's what they did. They took away all his weapons. It's the Chargers. Here's what my bro- my my podcast said about this move that I listened to. Okay. It's purely because Jim Harbaugh is a run-first team and they don't have a need for a number one wide receiver, which I think is a big mistake. <laughs> that that's podcast the case. is dumber than I, anything I've ever okay, heard. Okay, they're not saying that's fact. What are they saying? Because if you look at what happened when Jim Harbaugh this was in San Francisco. This isn't the 1972 Dolphins. You've got to still throw the ball in the NFL. And one of the reasons why everybody's so excited about the Chargers now is because Jim Harbaugh is going to take over and make Justin Herbert 10 times better than he ever was before. He's certainly not going to be able to do that without people to throw to. Well, when the 49ers so this podcast doesn't know what the hell okay, it's talking well, about. The podcast is, is reg- regardless of the podcast. Well, I, I, don't tell that was me a regardless theory. Of it's okay it's to be, a, it's okay to throw out a theory. It's a bad, but when theory. you look at what they brought in, what he did with the 49ers, when he was head coach, Jim Harbaugh, of the 49ers, and it was a mostly balanced thing, but they did not really have a number one wide receiver. Crabtree best, wasn't? He's not a number one. All right. Or at any point in his career, okay. was he a number one? All right. So there you go. I think they are going to regret this. I also think the Chargers are giving Jim Harbaugh too much power, which is all they're going to do. So. Go for it. Also, some people I'm think tired because, of talking about the Chargers in any way, shape, okay, or form. We, frankly, we, we talk about them like once a week, and every time we talk about them, it's some mention of how great Justin Herbert is. I'm so tired <laughs> of it. I would choose Justin Herbert in a draft right now over Tua. I would too, but you know, win a game once in a while, will you? <laughs> good, good point. <laughs> good point. I mean. At least the Dolphins do. At least Tua's got a good quarterback record. Tua can beat bad teams. And he can do it with regularity. He just can't beat a good team. He just can't beat a good team. He can't. No. It's true. Like, it, it is. Yeah, whatever. All oh, right. Jimmy G is now a Ram. What? Yeah. That got away from me. I didn't see that. The Jimmy Raiders. Garoppolo, my favorite quarterback in the National Football League, is signed Yes, with the Rams. The Raiders let him go after they signed him to like a $100 million deal. He's now with the Rams. That's not fair. Rams are just stockpiling talent. Jimmy G, along with Matthew Stafford. Oh, one one other trade today. Oh, also Aaron Donald. Retired? Yes. I saw that. He retired, so that's good. Kyler Murray tweeted back to his tweet saying, thank God, because he's tired of being tackled (laughs) by Aaron Donald. uh, I I don't blame him. Uh, Steelers are trading quarterback Kenny Pickett to the Eagles. Oh, good good for small hands. That's not good for him. He's in a lot better shape in Pittsburgh. Where he'd, have really. a chan- he'd have a chance to beat out Russell Wilson. There's He's zero gonna- chance. They're going to play Kenny Pickett over Russell Wilson. All right. There might be 1% chance he could beat out Russell Wilson. There is 0.00 chance he's beating out Jalen Hurts. Oh, I agree with that. Thank you. I agree with that. Glad. Can't, that even, can't, to- even, can't even be crazy. Glad and try we were to able to come something. to agreement on something. All right. Or agreeance on something. We're getting a lot of, uh, stop talking about the Chargers. Yeah, I'm with you. I'm the kind of guy who, when you tell me to stop talking about the Chargers, I want to talk about it more, but I won't. I'm with you, folks. Coming right. back, Charger offseason preview. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, probably something other than that in the 5 o'clock hour. The happy hour. It's been we, pretty happy today. We've done all right. I'm Gwen and Chris.
Be the fan. All right, here we go into the happy hour. Gwen and Chris. 501 is the time. Chris Ello, Matt Scraby together in our Odyssey Palace studios. Tony Gwynn Jr., of course, in Korea with the Padres. South Korea, as it were. Seoul, South Korea, yes. to be more specific. Yes. If you want to see a lot of video footage and pictures of the Padres, look up Bob Scanlon's Twitter account. At HeyScan. Hey, Scan. Hey, Scan. Hey, Scan. He's doing a great job of giving me FOMO, for sure. Fear of missing out. Fear of missing out. You don't want to miss out. Well, you know how much I wanted to go to this Korea trip, and you know how much I begged the station to let me go, and you know how much I begged people for a GoFundMe, and it just didn't come together. Jeff Passan on ESPN today writing about the Padres, actually writing about every team in Major League Baseball, his season preview. Thought I'd share a little of it with you because – you won't be able to access the story. We're doing this thing again? Unless you pay for it. I think last week I, I stole that from you, Chris. It's just ridiculous that you got to pay for a story on the internet. Extra money. This... Like, really? Jeff Passon's so good that his story is worth me paying for. And guess what? I do. I pay for it. Uh, he says, "Why the he? here's who he sees the Padre season hinging on. Fernando. That's it? Yeah, it says Fernando's got to show up. He's got to rank high in the MVP balloting to help wipe out the Padres' memories of a disastrous 2023. Even in a down year, Fernando put up a 5.5 war. His OPS last year, and I don't know what you believe in more, Scrape, war or OPS? OPS. Me too. His OPS last year was nearly 200 points lower than his previous full season of 2021. 2022 was not a full season. 2021 was a full season? Well, I guess so. Yeah. He had an NL leading 42 home runs that year. Okay, yes. But it was 200 points lower last year. The precipitous power dip was alarming, says Passan. But if the Padres want to win this division, they'll need the best version of Tatis. What's the best bet to Jeff Passan? Says even in a relatively down year with only 138 games played, Manny Machado hit 30 home runs. Bet the over, which is 29 and a half on Machado this year. I guess there's odds in Vegas of his home run total. Oh, yeah. 29 and a half. Pass and says bet over. On, on Machado hitting 30, he hits 30 th- or more. He hits 30 or more every single year. Seems like, like he does it in his sleep. And he did it last year with being injured. Yes, he did. Uh, how to win your fantasy league. Pay attention, Scrape. I am. Trust the stuff and get Dylan Cease. Ah. It's true. He's coming off a down season after he finished second in the AL Cy Young. But that just means there's an opportunity to get him cheaper. Cease is currently the 29th ranked starter in ESPN drafts, about three times higher than he was last year. But Cease struck out 214 hitters in 177 innings. And he hasn't suffered an injury in his five-year career. Pitcher, pitchers keep getting hurt. Cease's availability separates him from his peers. Mm, it does. There you go. He hasn't really missed the start in the last three seasons. There's a cease vote right there from Jeff Passan. Who's next? This is easy. Leave it to the Padres to take their best prospect, shortstop Jackson Merrill. Turn him into a center fielder. The reviews on Merrill's defense are mixed. But every evaluator agrees he can really, really hit. Merrill crushed a pair of home runs in spring training and OPS nearly 1,000 to lock down the center field job. Now comes the hard part, seeing if the 20-year-old is as ready as the Padres believe him to be. Is he 20? I thought he was 21. No, he's 20. Okay. Isn't that, isn't that crazy? 20. Can you imagine? I would love to be 20 years old playing Major League Baseball. That'd be crazy. that'd be a lot of fun. That would be real fun. I, I'd take it even at 60. Be fun to still be playing Major League Baseball. I have fun playing my Wednesday softball league. So how much fun would I have if I could still play in the Major Leagues? You would love it. Yeah. It would be everything to you. Had two hits last night in my softball game, and that was like made me feel good. Did you make it to first in time? <laughs> no, I say that because you say that you don't like to run because you sometimes pull your hamstring or something. 
Wow. I didn't say anything wrong. Make me sound like I'm totally out of shape and like, you know, know, just barely held together with twigs. Well, sometimes you come in here after refing a basketball game and you're like, oh, yeah, yeah but I'm not I'm never going to ref again. I can barely move. <laughs> Refing is over for this season. So <laughs> uh, my my legs are fresh. Are you, that's not true. Aren't you doing something this weekend? Well, tomorrow I'm going to be doing a, with some other guys. We're doing some refing for um, the Special Olympics. Oh, which very is, nice. Uh, you know, I don't want to pat myself on the back. I'm. Not I brought it, it up. You brought it up, so I'm answering. Yes, it but is. I think it'll be nice. I wanted people to know it's a nice this. thing to do. And, and so you're so. going to be refing a, a basketball game. I'm assuming. I'm assuming it's some basketball game, and yeah, we just go out there with the kids, and uh, you know, nobody gets paid anything, and we encourage them, and yeah, I think I'm going to try to tee one of them up. <laughs> Wait a second, <laughs> you're going to tee one of them up? Give them the real experience. Well, I mean, I guess if they do something that deserves yes. a tee, you're going to have to tee them. Darn right. <laughs> that was really funny. Can you imagine <laughs> Chris at a like a, a Special Olympics thing doing something <laughs> nice and he teased the person up. And and you eject them at the same time? Them. Somebody's parent where are your parents, young man? Have them take you home. Oh my god. That behavior will not be tolerated. <laughs> that is ridiculous. <laughs> oh, by the way, someone says, Hey Chris, when are you and I gonna do the Oklahoma drill? Remember when you said you could take you me and down? I? Yeah. Yeah. Not anytime soon. Okay. Uh I just thought we'd look at the rest of the NL West who Jeff Passman had in those same categories. Uh why the hinge the season hinges? It's on Mookie Betts for the Dodgers. What's the best bet? The Dodgers have won 104 plus games three of the last four years. They won 100 the other season. Still, bet the under on 103.5 victories. 103.5. Yeah, said bet under because it's extremely difficult to win a 104, and the Dodgers are still going to be without Shohei Otani on the mound. Do you think that they're the infield is a bigger problem than maybe? People are leading. Well, on. it's a problem, no doubt. I mean, if you have terrible infield defense, and apparently they do, you know, with Lux struggling badly, bets, and now it's short. Muncie's never going to be a good third baseman. Yeah. Uh, Freddie Freeman will save a bunch of their errors, but he can't save them all. Yeah. Yeah. That makes your worst team. I mean, that makes your pitching worse. It makes everything worse. But right. it wears on you after a while. They can hit. I love it. How to win your uh, fantasy league. Get Otani at a discount oh, in your keeper league. Thank you. No, get him in a – his point is get him in a keeper league and reap the benefits next season when he can pitch again. Because a lot of people might not go get him. Okay. I, I that, was, that, was, that was worthless advice. Uh, who's next? With bets moving to the middle infield, uh, bats could be available in right field, which might prompt the Dodgers to summer, summon Andy Pages. P-A-G-E-S. Haven't heard of him. No, me neither. 23-year-old uh, is very good in the outfield. Uh, Page is what really separates him within the organization is defensively. He had labrum surgery in 2023. Andy Pages. Keep an eye on that for the Dodgers. Uh, Arizona Diamondbacks. The season hinges on. Zach Gallen. Uh, we know how good he is. I think the, the question that Passon's throwing on here is, might be a decent one. Gallon did have an extra 40 innings pitched in the postseason last year. Could that wear on his arm? We'll see. I mean, that's not I'm a just bad thought. It out no, there. no, it's not a bad thought. Yeah. Uh, what's the best bet? Anything with Corbin Carroll, really. Over 22 and a half home runs, check. NL MVP at plus 2,000, check. Leading the NL in hits at plus 5,000, why not? Uh, he loves Corbin Carroll. So does pump, everybody else. I, I know he's good, but I need to pump the brakes on Corbin Carroll. He needs to like be a superstar for me to believe in that. Well, it's his second year, and he's really got high expectations. He does. Now. He really does. How to win your fantasy league? Select Gabriel Moreno okay, and make price. sure to keep him for the next decade. Okay. Wow. <laughs> okay. Moreno gold glove defense doesn't show up in fantasy, but he's a high average hitter whose power showed up in October when he hit four home runs in 17 games. Who's next? No prospect in baseball is as blocked as Jordan Lawler, the shortstop who has Geraldo Perdomo ahead of him at short, Cattell Marte ahead of him at second, and Eugenio Suarez at third. 
Lawler is young enough to head back to AAA for more seasoning, but he really doesn't need it. And we'll finish with the Giants. You might be thinking to yourself, but aren't there five teams in the NL West? Mm -hmm. Yes, but I'm not going to waste your time with any talk about the Rockies. Is Chris Bryant the one that it hinges all <laughs> on? Uh, the Giants season hinges on Logan Webb. He did finish, what, third in the Cy Young last year? Yes. Or second? He had a remarkably great year. His ground ball rate was 62%, highest among qualified starters by 8%. He, like, blows everybody out. Nobody can even hit a fly ball off this guy. Uh, what's the best bet? For the last three years, Kyle Harrison has been seen as the best left-handed pitching prospect in baseball. His 34-inning debut last year illustrated that his stuff will play at the big league level. Between innings and strikeouts that will accompany a plus 2,500 odds to win Rookie of the Year, that is a bet that would offer a strong reward. Kyle Harrison, Rookie of the Year possibility. Okay. How to win your fantasy league. Enjoy the versatility of Thyro Estrada. Oh, yes. I had him last year. He plays like five different positions. He was pretty good. He steals bases. Blooming middle infielder, plays second short. Not great at anything. He's good at everything, though. And he has a high ADP of 229. Sorry, I don't know what that Average is. Average draft position. There you go. Uh, who's next? Well, for the Giants, it had better be Young Hu Lee. Mm, yes. The Giants blew away the competition, signing him to a six-year, $113 million contract. Now he's the everyday center fielder for blah, blah, blah. Expect Lee to join. <laughs> blah, blah, blah. Matt Chapman, Solaire Hicks as players who make a difference between 79 wins last year and a team that can compete with the Dodgers, Diamondbacks, and Padres. So he puts all four Question for in you. the playoff hunt. I can't yeah. believe I didn't think of this earlier when we were talking about DHs. Mm -hmm. JD Davis was just uh, shipped out by the Giants. I like JD Davis. I do too. I'm he's my best friend him. after I saved I him from falling but over the wall. He's a right handed bat. That's yeah, the last thing the Padres yeah, need. Exactly. Okay. Uh, do you really want to know anything about the Rockies? No. Just give me who the fantasy thing is. Okay. Tovar. How to win your fantasy league? Oh, boy. Draft right-hander Justin Lawrence and hope that he can stay as closer all season. Hope that he can stay as closer. Getting saves on the cheap is a quality that plenty of frontline fantasy owners embrace. That is true. Because jobs change hands so often. For now, 29-year-old Lawrence is a favorite. With the Rockies likely to play a number of close games, the hard-throwing, late-blooming Lawrence could turn into the David Bednar of the West. David Bednar was a good guy to have very last good. year for Pittsburgh. Oh, yeah, very good. The problem with Justin Lawrence and having the Rockies closer, because I've had the Rockies closer in the past. They don't win much? No, they could get their saves, but there's that one or two games where they give up eight runs in the top of the ninth because it's oh, course field. And then your ERA is oh, done. Oh, God, it's just blown out of proportion. That does stink. That's something that's a little bit frustrating. All right, we'll take a timeout. When we come back, uh, we visited with Mark Ziegler earlier today. He's in Las Vegas. Utah State taking on the Aztecs tonight. We'll have that a little later. But prefer, first, we'll have Sammy Levitt from Peoria, where he was unable to broadcast today's Padres futures game, but he was able to give us a nice. Jeez. Oh, wow. Ooh. I was mad at that. That was harsh. Uh, he was giving us to give us a good look at the 31 man roster that the Padres took with them to Korea and what that all means. Padre fans, stick around after traffic.
All right, welcome back. 5.22 the time. Chris Ello, Matt Scraby, Gwen and Chris, 97.3 The Fan. Thanks for joining us today. We appreciate it. We weren't really even supposed to have a show today. But the Somewhere. Padres, what do they call this stupid thing or what they're going to call it? The spring, spring breakout. Yeah, whatever. Spring breakout. All these clever marketing geniuses. The one thing the clever marketing geniuses could not plan for was the rain, which wiped out the game entirely today. What are the odds? The two games that we have had during the week here, I mean, I know that they played that one on Thursday, the opening game, but the last two have been rained out. What are the odds? Astronomical. Thank you. Thank you. God. I think you bet you're, you'll find DB Cooper before you'll figure <laughs> that one out. Uh, we had some fun today with all those conspiracies. All right. Uh, we uh, caught up, though, with Sam Levitt in Peoria. After the rain out today. And uh, first of all, he's on his way home tomorrow from spring training. Let's hear it for the brilliant reporting skills over the last month of Sam Levitt. Huh? Woohoo! Sammy's been uh, everywhere. He's done a fantastic job. Uh, did a nice job today helping us break down the Padres' 31 man roster, which is on its way to Korea. Oh, that was my cue? That's your cue. Okay, here it is. So what's your thoughts on uh, the 31-man roster as it was uh, set by the Padres going into uh, the Korea series, Sam? What did you? Well, any surprises to you? Um, No, not really. Uh, no surprises. I mean, we got the answer as to which position player would be left off, and that was Oscar Mercado. But aside from that, I mean, we, we kind of knew based on the guys that were still in Major League Camp and the number of position player spots they had um, wow. that, that I, I think I may have talked to you about this one, maybe not you guys, Ben and Woods or, or Craig and Annie, um, that essentially one guy out of that position player group was going to be left off. The Padres decided to go with 17 pitchers. On the travel roster, which obviously was not a was not a surprise, and look, a lot happened between the time they they said it and then uh, they actually left with the trade for Cease. So Wilson gone, Cease now on the roster with the seventeen pitchers. No surprise that Avila, Morahone, uh, that a lot of guys made it onto the travel roster. And look, I we made a big deal out of the travel roster. I think in retrospect, like yeah, that was part of it. Is they kind of whittled down the the big group. But the big decisions are coming up here in the next few days when we see who starts, who appears in the exhibition games, then who's on the 26-man roster for the two games against the Dodgers, and then ultimately who's uh, on the roster on the 28th. So no real surprises, I thought. We got the answer about Mercado not being on it, but uh, yeah, n nothing really, uh, really shocked you about the uh, travel roster at this point. Yeah, nothing shocked me about the travel roster either sam if you cared we don't uh, <laughs> i knew you were gonna say so that. let's move hold on, on. Hold what? On. so, so do you a have question. a question about was there a question there no i do have a question that i was asked on twitter last night after the scravy show and i'm curious for you guys' answers but with darvish musgrove and cease going one two three they're all righties does that worry you at all about the potential matchups going forward sam I'm panicked personally. Um, <laughs> I hope Sam can really? make me feel better. Um, look, it's a little odd not to have a lefty starter, I suppose. It's not the end of the world. The weird thing is that the Padres are are full of righties. Uh, anybody who would make a start right now, I mean, you even think about Vasquez and Brito and Waldron, the guys in that mix, Avila from the start of spring training. They're everybody's all righties. Righty. Yeah. yeah, everybody's a righty, to be honest with you, as far as like, guys that would make a start anytime soon i'd really have to go back and, and look at kind can't of, even find anybody really yeah Sam. i mean there's I nobody there they got four I, lefties on the staff and they're all relievers yeah so I can there's think no of like you know Robbie this is a, this is, i'm gonna be honest i'm gonna tell in, whoever in who, whoever texted you or, or, or chatted you or was concerned about this eh, stupid don't be don't, concerned. Don't say stupid. Yeah, I, They're I don't, not stupid. I, it's it's stupid to be concerned is my is yeah. where I wanted to go. Because yeah, I, you want yeah. the best five pitchers. It doesn't matter. This has no – this isn't like putting a lineup together where you want to, you know, try to alternate righty, lefty, et cetera, right. for matchups. This is getting your best five starters out there regardless. If they were all lefties, then they'd all be lefties. Yeah, look, I, I guess hypothetically against lineups that 
you know, are, are left-handed heavy that hit righties well, maybe you run into a problem a little bit if you only have righties. So let's say in a three, four game series, whatever it is, you, you don't have a lefty throw. Yeah, it's, it could be a little bit of a disadvantage, but to your point, the bigger problem is if you don't have lefties in your bullpen day to day and the Padres have plenty of those. So who knows? Um, you know, I, I think, I think now it's going to be really interesting with the addition of cease and, seeing if this team at at minimum can hang around into the season, be around a postseason spot, and how aggressive, and we're a ways away from this, but how aggressive they would be, let's say, uh, during the summer and at the trade deadline, let's say they they, ident- they identify the need for a left-handed starter. We're a ways away from that, but it's something to think about, monitor, keep in mind. I don't think it's the biggest deal in the world, though, no. Sam Levitt is in uh, rainy Peoria today. The uh, Futures game got uh, canceled today, got rained out today. So uh, that uh, leaves us doing a show, and it leaves Sammy without a game to call. But he's nice enough to join us here. Uh, now, are you uh, heading back to San Diego after this, Sam? Are you? Uh, do you have anything left to do there? Or there's nobody there other than young players, right? Well, yeah, th- there's – well – I don't have anything left to do as far as coverage here. If I really wanted to, I'm sure I could do plenty with the minor leaguers, but I will head back tomorrow. I've got some dinner plans tonight. Quite frankly, I haven't packed up or anything yet because I, I, oh uh, boy, I, uh, I knew I always knew I was leaving tomorrow. So I still will leave tomorrow. Got one night left in the Airbnb. Then I'll uh, head out of here uh, sometime tomorrow morning. (laughs) But I I do think it's important. I do think it's important to note. um, And I don't know that people always realize this, that just because the major league team isn't here doesn't mean there's nothing going on at the complex. In fact, there's a lot going on. It's all of minor league spring training still going on. And that's every full season team. That's guys who will play in the Arizona complex league. Potentially Uh, there are, there are still, you know, I don't know how many exactly, but between players and coaches and support staff and medical staff and the people who run Peoria sports complex, uh, there are still at least 100, 200, I don't know what number it is, people here um, on a day-to-day basis as these guys get ready for the minor league season. So you show up in Peoria on any given day. It's actually pretty active as far as the bullpens and the backfields. And I don't know that people realize that minor leaguers actually play each other as well. Like, uh, for example, the Rangers double-A team of the year will come to Peoria to play the Padres double A team and vice versa. The Padres double A team will go to Mesa to play the Cubs double A team. So spring training continues. It's a weird year because it's March 15th and the major leaguers are done for good, but uh, still a lot of activity here. But uh, unless uh, our friend Adam Klug tells me I'm, I'm staying here for extensive if minor league coverage. If he tells you you're staying there, you tell him you're not. <laughs> if he tells me I'm staying here for extensive minor league coverage, <laughs> honestly, be fine. There's a lot to talk about, and uh, I enjoy the minor league stuff. I, I doubt that's going to happen. No, so, we yes, need you I back. assume I'm out of here tomorrow. Yeah. We need you back in San Diego. Well, yeah, Diego. the game's in uh, – sorry. No way. We got games uh, yeah. just uh, in a handful of days here, 2 a.m. Yeah. pregame. We need He's going to be 2 a.m. on Wednesday morning, 2.05 a.m. You is know when what? The I'm going to be starts. sitting right beside him, Scrib. I'm going to come Kluge into the studio. said on the chat. You're staying there, Sammy. <laughs> yeah, right. I'm gonna I'm gonna come in at 2 a.m. on uh, on Wednesday and just sit with Sam. Just give him a little support. You, you are not. You just, don't, I, don't, hey, don't make promises already, you can't keep. I'm already planning to be at the uh, at the uh, Seven Mile Casino. You better be really? there. You, you have party. locked yourself no in. Way. At 3 That's what oh, I said, absolutely. Sam. Absolutely, I'm gonna be there. I'm not missing that. That's what I, I said, Sam. I don't buy that first. You don't think no I'll offense. be there, Chris? You guys don't think I'll you're, be there? Hold on. Chris, you're telling me you're going to be up at 2, 3 a.m. and going down to Seven Mile Casino. You guys don't understand how my – I'm so old now that, that first of all, I have to get up about 13 times every night, all right? Oh, gosh. Not that many. Not, but we you didn't know need to know I'm, that. I'm, well, you know what I'm saying. Wow. If, well, if you're there, good for you. So I, I'll I, be up anyway. I'll be up. <laughs> i got nothing to do. All right, I want to ask you two quick questions, Sam. i got three okay. minutes. Yeah. Who do you think is going to be the number five starter? Mm-hmm. If you had to call it, and of Rosa- you got Eggy Rosario, Tyler Wade, or Graham Pauly, which of those three do you think will get get the short end and be sent out before the? If you had to call those two races, mm-hmm. not easy, but I'm going to give you a shot. Uh, the number five spot, I said yesterday on the uh, round table, I thought Waldron. I'll stay with that. Okay. Um, you know, how confident am I in that? 
don't know. Um, I think there's a case for Burrito uh, for sure. But to me, Matt Waldron's earned it. He's been great. I like the fact that he's built up, you know, a little bit more innings-wise and a little bit more traditional starter-wise than some of the other guys okay. from last year. You know, although it's, you know, I don't know, does having Dylan Cease, the fact that now you've got a guy who could eat up some innings, does that change the equation? I don't know, but I'll go with Waldron. I will. Okay. He's earned it too. So I'll say him and we'll see if that actually happens. Um, as far as the Wade rosario Pauly part, uh, I have to really crunch the, the 26 here, but um, I think Paulie's. I think Paulie's going to make it. Okay. I do. I've thought that for some time. I'm not going to back down on that. I thought Wade's going to make it. I would say if there was, if I had to pick one guy on the outside looking in, I would say Rosario um, for the reason of Wade's had a great spring. I think Paulie has had a really good spring. And I do believe that, the, you know, that, that taking Graham Pauly to Korea and the way they started him throughout the Cactus League, the way they've treated him, to me, it said a lot throughout the spring. And I I would imagine if you, if you used him like that during the spring and you took him to Korea, that you are planning in all likelihood to put him on the roster. And I'll tell you this, if he's going to be on the roster, he's going to play. He's got to play because he can't sit and play once a week. That's, and I know, you know, uh, philosophy wise, the Padres, they believe in these young guys. If, if, if that they believe can make an impact that they got to play. So I think Paulie, if he's on the roster is going to find a way into the lineup, at least early on, you see what he can do uh, more days than not. So for that reason with Paulie, Wade set a good spring and also Wade can play the outfield a little bit. I think he's a little bit more versatile than Rosario is defensively. I've never had the sense that the Padres are, you know, like married to the idea of Rosario has to be up there. So I'll I'll say Wade and Pauly make it, and Rosario is on the outside looking in. Of course, they could all make it. Hypothetically, I'd have to crunch the bench again. I well, they'd have to they'd couple. have to send Sullivan down. They got to send somebody down. Well, right, so. and and yeah. So so and let's pick one. That. Let's let's pick one on the outside looking in, and yeah. I'll say Rosario is on the outside looking in with Pauly and Wade making it. There you go. Should be ready for opening day. Sammy Levitt, who was brilliant at spring training. How many times did he uh, join the shows, would you say, over the last month? Well, Between all three of our shows? Um, 25? Well, definitely once per day. 25 times. I mean, he no, was more. 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 The morning has him on every day. Wow. Yeah. Morning's like, come on, guys. No. Really? That's Sammy it? spring training. Oh, Sammy spring training? Yeah. Oh, that's a big deal? Yeah, every year they do Sammy Spring Training. Oh, wow. Yeah. Why mm. are you looking at me like that? Sam also filled in for me when I was sick, and then you when you were sick. And I was Sam's... not sick. Were you not sick? No, I was traveling. Oh, that's right. Sorry. All right, we got that. Mark Ziegler to get us ready for tonight's Aztec-Utah State game from Las Vegas next on Gwen and Chris.
Korea, to be exact. Padres and Dodgers next Wednesday morning. That'd be a 3 a.m. start, but if you're going to get up for the game, then get on up at 2 a.m. I agree. Don't want to miss Sammy Levitt's first pregame show of the year. Absolutely not. Come on. Absolutely not. Scraby and I are going to be down at the uh, viewing party. Heck yeah. Next Wednesday morning at 3 a.m. That is taking place at Seven Mile Casino right off the 5 Freeway down there in Chula Vista. Real convenient to get to. Uh, Honestly, you get on the 5, you go south from downtown about, duh, seven miles. Duh. That's the name of the place. You get off, and the casino's right there. Okay. I mean, right there. I'm going to do it like you did that one time when we went to Carlsbad. I'm going to take your directions that you just gave me. Oh, my directions will get you there. If you get off the exit and you turn right, it's right there. One time we went to Carlsbad High School, and I you told You gave Chris, me the worst directions I, of all I didn't time. expect you to if follow we, my directions. Why not? Because everybody just types it into a GPS, and I, I assumed, and that was my problem. Give the guy directions. I listen to you. Dummy me. I think I said, what did I say? <laughs> like, just drive inland? <laughs> yeah, just turn right. It's right. No, you said turn right off the freeway. It's right there. <laughs> it was like six blocks over. Chris drove to, like, Vista. I almost got the Vista before I stopped going and called him and said, where are you sending me? On the scoreboard, Houston, a 17-0 run is pulled away from Texas Tech. 59-41 Cougs in the Big 12 tourney. At the uh, ACC tourney, North Carolina holding a 58-54 lead over Pitt, 7.22 to go in the second half. At the SEC tourney, Texas A&M leads number nine, Kentucky, 69-59. At the Big Big Ten tournament, Illinois by one over Ohio State, 75-74. They're in the final minute of that game. Pac-12, Arizona leads Oregon, 27-13 first half. Later on, Aztecs, Utah State. Let's check traffic. Then Mark Ziegler from Vegas to get us ready for tonight's game. From the 97.3 The Fan Traffic Center, here's Kelly Danik. Several problems in the North County. The right lane of southbound at 15 near the 76 is flooded. Now, further down before Gopher Canyon, there is a collision in the center divide. Another vehicle over to the right shoulder. South 5 coastline near Oceanside Boulevard. There is a collision blocking the slow lane. Also traveling on eastbound 78 just before San Marcos Boulevard. Reading reports of some debris in that right lane. Else around the county, southbound side of the 15 at the northbound 5 connector ramp. There is a collision in the center divide. A couple vehicles involved in the crash. Still clearing southbound 125 before Lemon Avenue. I'm Kelly Danik with Gwen and Chris, San Diego's number one sports station, 97.3, the fan. A couple of things you can really count on, Scraby. Death, taxes, and a great story in the paper every morning by Mark Ziegler following Aztec basketball. Mark is uh, nice enough to join us on short notice in Las Vegas today. Mark, thanks so much. How are things in Vegas? The Aztecs are probably a little relieved to still be alive. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. It's raining here, okay. which I thought was kind of interesting. Woke up and it was raining. Hmm. But, yeah, I I, um, I think there's kind of a palpable sense of relief um, because, you know, look, let's not fool anybody. They were not playing well, and they did not play well again yesterday. And it, it wasn't on the same scale as last year's Charlotte game, the first first game, uh, Charleston game, and the first game of the NCAA tournament when they didn't play well and they almost lost and they pulled it out, and then they just kind of – you know, there's this weight lifted off their shoulders and they rolled from there. But it's kind of the same feeling. I think that, you know, they kind of feel like, hey, we made some plays down the stretch finally. We won a close game, technically on the road. Um, and it just boosted up a little bit. So I think they're in a much better place mentally today than they were yesterday. Well, I hope so, because you're right. I mean, the first half was not easy to watch, not for the faint of heart. I mean, air balls, layups hitting the underside of the rim, turnovers the whole the whole thing but uh i thought that play darian Tramel made was was you know big and i wonder what you were thinking unlv calls a timeout there with 1.6 seconds left really what are the odds that they're going to score in a full court play thought they got a little greedy and the uh Trammell made him pay for it yeah i think you know part of the thought was that there was going to be 2.5 seconds left because if you did the math and it was a shot clock violation right before that on San Diego State. If you'd done the math, um, 
and and subtracted the shot clock from the game clock, it was 2.5. Okay. So at 2.5, you think you can get the ball up the floor and you know, up the floor and maybe get a decent look at a three. Right. And then the, during that timeout and that break, they they reviewed it and they only I mean I don't even know if they did review it, but they just gave him 1.6. Okay. And uh, and then it went downhill from there very quickly for them and. They knew that was a costly play, and the Aztecs, uh, you know, I don't know if the players knew as much as the coaches realized that that was a big turning point for them, and they really pumped them up in the, at halftime, just kind of saying, look, guys, don't be so glum. You know, we just got a huge momentum change there, and that's going to lift the lid on the basket. Talking to Mark Ziegler here, talking about the Aztecs basketball team and Jaden Ladeep basically putting the team on his back, but I want to ask about the final play of the game because I thought – I didn't know. Chris told me earlier in the show that that Brian Dutcher said to foul him immediately upon catching the ball, but no one even touched him, and he did get a pretty good look off or pretty good shot off. Do you know what happened there? Well, you know, they, you call timeout with two point seven seconds left, and you're up three. It's a pretty good indication you're going to try to foul. But when I asked Brian Dutcher about it afterwards, he goes, "Yeah, well, it was tricky because with two point seven seconds, they're not going to have a lot of time before they catch." And they have to shoot. And so you, the, the, the nightmare is, and the nightmare that every coach has, is that you, you tell your team to foul, and they foul a guy in the act of shooting a three, and they get three free throws. Right. Um, this was, you know, they had to go the length of the floor. And so I think the plan was, look, if he catches his back to the basket, foul him. And then beyond that, we're going to put two guys on Deaton Thomas, you know, Butler and Trammell, one in front, one behind, and just make them take a ridiculously hard three. And that was, that was what he really wanted. And none of that happened. I think they had a chance to foul. They didn't foul. <laughs> and then they didn't, they didn't bracket them. And, and Dutcher, Dutcher, uh, uh, afterwards, you know, someone asked, I, someone asked him about it and he just said, well, uh, that went well, didn't it? Yeah, <laughs> it didn't, but it, it turned out okay. All right, give me a quick uh, preview of tonight's game. Uh, going, you know, to looking at the two games during the regular season between the Aztecs and Utah State and what we can expect tonight. Well, they split the games at home. Um, they were in the game at Logan, uh, down one late, and and just fell apart down, just like they did in every other road game, just couldn't make plays down the stretch and lost by uh, like five. Uh, but it was a much closer game there. Uh, I think they have a great chance tonight because um, Utah State is not a very deep team. They're not built for three games in three days or even two games in two days. And one of their starters, um, Mason Fowles, uh, Paul Slev is, is out, uh, and he, he he could still play tonight, but he didn't play yesterday with a with a shoulder. Um, they went to overtime as well. Uh, don't have a deep bench. Um, you know, Osibor looked absolutely exhausted. So did Ladie. But if you know, if you're looking at you know exhaustion, I, I'll take Ladie. He's in much better shape uh, than <laughs> Osibor. Great Osibor. So I, I think it's a great shot for the Aztecs. I think on a neutral floor, they're the better team. Now they're still going to have to make some shots, something they haven't done. Um, but uh, I think they, they just given their pedigree in this tournament and maybe they have a little bit of their swagger back now, I, I, I like to think that this is the kind of game they can go and take care of business. Talking to Mark Ziegler here about the Aztecs and with Jaden Ladee facing great Ostabor, and he's the guy who won the Mountain West uh, Coaches Player of the Year. Do you think there's any, I mean, I'm sure there's extra motivation, but what do you think Jaden Ladee is, how he's going into this game playing against the guy who beat him out? Well, I'm sure he's he's thinking. I want to prove to him that I'm the I prove to everybody that I'm the player of the you know should be the consensus player of the year. And Osabor is looking at him, going, "Well, I was the coach's player of the year. I don't know what the media was thinking. I'm gonna I'm gonna prove to everybody <laughs> that I'm the player of the year." So I think it's gonna be a pretty good battle. And I, I officials, you know, as Chris will tell you, are always really important in games like this. It's how they're gonna call it, how tight they're gonna call it. Osabor is a hard guy to, to uh, officiate. I interested to get your thoughts on this, Chris. But I think he's a hard guy to officiate because he falls down all the time. Like, yeah, I mean, I, I was really counting tough. yesterday. Yeah, yeah. It's like, is he is he falling down because he doesn't have a good balance? Is he falling down because he's flopping? Is he falling down because he's getting shoved? But he's two hundred fifty, sixty pounds. So I, I don't know. I mean, I think that I think the whistle is going to be big. I would honestly, I think if I'm officiating him, telling him to stop fall, tell him to stop falling down, and hopefully he gets some of that message because that you're right, it makes it easy for me to easier for me to officiate if he's not falling all the time. But that is a tough one, uh, Mark. Let me. Ask, it's interesting you mentioned the falling down. I want to ask you an interesting question. You and I kind of talk about on the side. 
but it is about, uh, I don't know, just the class of the behavior of players on the floor and where we're going with this. I watched Jalen House last night. I know, I know he wants to be a villain. He has to play up this role. But he was out of control again last night, screaming at the crowd, waving, blowing kisses, falling down, almost ended up getting in a fight at the end of the game with, uh, I think it was Anderson of Boise State. You uh, were doing the, the women's basketball post game the other night when uh, Desiree Young of UNLV, after they beat the Aztecs, basically said, we wish we could have played somebody better than them in the final. What is going on here? And, and should we accept this as just, you know, young kids the way they are these days? Or is there something amiss a little bit? I think there's something amiss. I mean, I, I, what I think is happening is that, yes, there, it's a reflection of society. Um, and there's a much greater tolerance behavior. But I think we enable it too much. I think, you know, in sports where you can have sort of artificial boundaries on things, I think it would be a great example to, to rein that kind of behavior in. I mean, last night I was sitting courtside, watched the whole game. I saw everything he did. Uh, in the first half, he hit a shot and he – and he, he gestured or said something to the, to the Boise bench. And Greg Nixon was right there, veteran official. They had already teed up Leon Rice, the Boise State coach, for arguing. It was a great opportunity to sort of even the score. You've already given the, te- the team uh, for different reasons, but you've given them one. So he should have, and I think he was thinking about it, but it was earlier in the game, first half, and he didn't do it. And he just said, don't do that. That's all he said. Okay. And, and, you know, it doesn't work with Jalen house. Now you've enabled him. Um, and he just keeps going, going, going. And he's right on the line. He's pushing it. Most of his gesturing was to his own fans, but I just think that, that, that just heats up, you know, opposition fan unnecessarily. And you can have problems and then you almost did at the end of the game. But I think he had the, he had the opportunity there. And I bet you have the asked him in a candid moment, he wished he would have teed him up because that would have stopped it all because now he can't do anything for fear of getting tossed and, and maybe costing his team the game. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah, it's unfortunate because I, I really like to watch these kids play, but I think a little class would be nice. Uh, you and I both looked at each other the other night when uh, the UNLV gal said what she said. And it was just, it was a diss on your opponent. I mean, how about a little respect for who you're playing? And I, I know we're older, Mark, but I don't think we're that old to know what the difference sometimes between right and wrong. And yeah, now, now get off my lawn. Down, get <laughs> off, off each other's lawns. Have fun tonight. Thanks so much for joining us. Quick notice. That was very kind of you. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, right, enjoy buddy. the game. See you later. There Thanks, he goes. Mark. Mark Ziegler in Las Vegas. There he is. Yeah, Mark Ziegler wrapping things up for us. By the way, as you uh, Aztecs head into tonight's game, keep this in mind. And this is pretty impressive. Uh, they have been to the final game of the Mountain West Conference Tournament six years in a row. That is impressive. That coincides with Brian Dutcher's career. Oh. He's never fallen short of at least the Mountain West Conference wow. Tournament Championship game. Another feather in his cap. Yeah, and he's got a few of them. So Aztecs, Utah State tip off at 630. We appreciate you being with us today. Like I said, we weren't even supposed to be here. Hope you enjoyed what uh, Scraby and I were able to uh, cobble together. Cobbles, right. Are you doing a show next? Scraby shows up next. Scraby Chronicles? I have some news on Blake Snell that I'll tell everybody. Yeah, share it with us. I There's will. a new team in the hunt for Blake Snell. Yeah. Scraby's got that for you next. I'm Chris Ello. Have a good weekend. We'll catch up with you Monday. Tony should be back with us at some point Monday. So. Should. Talk to you later.